Here we are. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> wow. Just come down, Rich. <laughs> Wow. Okay. You're going to have to bear with us because we've never done anything like this before, but we're so excited to be here. And um, we're just counting down. Okay. Well, I think we're there. <laughs> okay, there you go. It's live, so you're just gonna have to, it's not gonna be slick, <laughs> but, we're, but we're enthusiastic. <laughs> Brilliant, so we're here, we're live, and we're getting ready for the Three Shires Festival. And, uh, wow, we've got an amazing lineup, haven't we? We have a very good lineup. But I think we'd better introduce ourselves first, haven't we? All right. That's a good start. This is Catherine. And this is David. And we're going to be your hosts for the day. Hopefully you link everything together and uh, make it all work. Because so hope. many people have worked so hard to put this festival together, you would not believe. I mean, we were hoping to be all sat out on the park and we were going to be playing our music and we were going to be, you know, all together hugging and dancing. But sadly, as you know, life had other plans. But we thought we still want to have fun and we still want to share all the talent that we've got together with you. And first up, we've got... An organ recital. An organ recital, yes. Tell us, who's going to be playing the organ, David? Uh, that's a very good question. It is a very good question. I haven't got my phone open. <laughs> right, okay. It's Paul Hodgetts. It is. I'm, no, gonna, I'm, I'm Paul. gonna tell you all about him. One minute. One. Right, here we go. Paul Hodgetts. He is an experienced organist living in the West Midlands and he has been the director of music at Our Lady in St. Canelm's School in Hales Owen. And he is the accompanist for St. Ignatius Singers. And outside of that, he is so, oh, ooh, looks very, very clever man. And he does stuff with computers and software and consultancy. But he has been working hard as of all the artists. You know, people have been putting videos together. We've got poetry for you. We've got guitar. What else have we got lined up? Uh, we, we've got um, uh, Martha playing viola. We've got uh, John Barber. On the uh, piano. And, and well, we're not gonna go through them all now. Lots of things. <laughs> lots and lots of things. I am going to be doing a workshop at 12.30 myself. And that's going to be on mindfulness because, you know, it's been a bit of a stressful time, hasn't it? With all this coronavirus. And some of you just haven't managed to get out at all. I know there's some people who've been isolating and it's difficult. You may not have been able to see your friends. You may not have been able to see your family, but hopefully you've had a chance to get in into the garden and hopefully you've maybe had a chance to be creative do some poems do some music do some art and that's what all this festival's about it's about people showing off their creative talents with music and with um oh yes just loads of things i'm really really excited i mean tonight we have got an amazing lineup let me just give you a few of the timings that you need to watch out for because there's going to be something happening pretty much from now right through until nine o'clock tonight but we are going to have a few breaks but let's just go through the timetable for you so that you can uh, know what to expect our open mic will be kicking off at 1 30 and then we've got a workshop with Andy Swinford and this is for the more literary of you amongst us and he's going to be talking about Tolkien and Lewis, C.S. Lewis that is, and the natural world and that's going to be on Zoom so you need to 
How do they do on, that? It's on, it's on YouTube as well. It's on YouTube, so you don't need to click on to Zoom. You don't need to click on Zoom. No, you just need to come back here and, uh, yeah, he's going to be live talking about Tolkien and Lewis. So that's going to be good, and you might be able to ask some questions of your own. Then I think there's going to be a little short break. We're going to be a little short break. A little short break, long enough to make a cup of tea or find a suitable beverage. Indeed. Piece of cake. Indeed. Send some round to me if you've got, if you know my address. Um, so then we've got open mic again this afternoon at 3.30 and another great lineup for you with recorders, uh, vocalists and some lovely videos have been put together and some local scenes. Those of you who live around the West Midlands, yes, just better tell you where we are in the world really because some of you may be watching us from who knows where. Be lovely to hear where you're watching us from. Actually, we have got a little bit of a live chat thing going on, which somebody's monitoring in our very accomplished team. So yeah, where where are people coming from? We don't we don't know, but let us know as the day goes on. Then we've got poetry, and I, I know we've already got people from Southampton. Oh, uh, we we have. Excellent. Um, we've certainly got several from from West Midlands that are north. Um, and oh maybe somebody from south wales maybe my family's calling in to see me if they can work it all out and um so they'll be on by nine yes. o'clock tonight then. <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> and um yes yeah, so what else have we got we told you about the workshop with andy then we've got the open mic starting again at 3 30 this afternoon and then poetry corner at 4 30 and then, wow, we've got some treat for you tonight, haven't we? We have indeed. We have, we have scoured the country for the best and the brightest and the really wonderful up and coming new artists. These are two, we've got some young artists actually tonight, haven't we? we have. Sort of starting out in their career. So, you know, you're getting a chance to see them before they, you know, end up on Glastonbury or wherever else, or the Palladium or the Royal Albert Hall. We've got Chris Roberts and Michelle Holloway, and that's a guitarist duo with um, recorders. Yeah, that's going to be great. Then, and I know this lovely lady personally myself, this is Amy Naylor, and she plays the handpan, which is a relatively new instrument. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been around that long, and some people I talk to about this instrument have never even heard of it. So come and find out all about it. The lovely Amy Naylor will be doing, playing on a hand pan and playing guitar and doing some songs, I think. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm looking forward to seeing it. Then I'll be back on again at 8.30 tonight and um, I'm gonna be doing a meditation. Um, because I practice mindfulness and you know, sometimes we just need a little ways to learn, little ways to help us relax, unwind, get to sleep. So that we're gonna just have a little chill out and a wind down at the end of the evening. I'll certainly need it by then. So I'll be doing that um, around 8.30. Now, timings, let me just say from the start, are open to interpretation, wouldn't you say? Well, yes, but we are a festival, so... We're, we're, we're trying we're to get, we're, get we're, we're, we're up and running and we're live, which is, you know, I'm really excited about anyway. And hopefully, hopefully more people, us rugby team has <laughs> given people, more people a chance to, uh, to find us. Yes, I know. I think we've got, oh, we've got 12 people now. That's exciting. Tell your friends, you know, WhatsApp them all, get them all in to the, join the party. And right. so I just, think I think we should press on then. And, do you think and we better get going? Bring yes. on our first artist. Excellent. Here we go with Paul Hodgetts, and he's doing an organ recital. And enjoy. Uh, hang on. Oh, oh, technicals, technicals. Technical itch. We've got no sound. But we will have. We will have, we will have, just bear with the, uh, whatever, the, the PA man.
no, sorry. Okay, just gonna have to bear with us. This happens in real life as well, doesn't it? Just the same as uh, virtual, but we are gonna sort out this um, organ recital for you. One moment, it's nearly there. Okay, one moment. I've got lots of people telling me, yes, it's happening, don't worry. We just need to get this up and running. Okay. Oh, sorry, right, I can, I'm gonna have to waffle on about my... Ready? No sound. Hello. Right. We did say that we may have a few technical problems and I'm really sorry about this. So David's doing his best here, having a small heart attack, trying to sort it out. Um, so hopefully you're all lovely, friendly people. And I'd like to say talk amongst yourselves, but um, you know, that's not really possible either. Although we have got a bit of a live chat going on on the side. Okay, right. I don't know. It's just confusing me now. All right, Dave is trying to sort out the sharing the screen. Right, slight un.
again. Oh. <coughs> I'm very sorry about the, uh, the technical problems we had at the start there. Um, we, we will put uh, the full recital up on YouTube um, afterwards. So, um, in case we still get the problems there, which I think we have already done. Um, it, it's oh, I have messages from uh, yes um, the the workshop um, which uh, Catherine uh, is doing uh, will be yeah. oh. yes I'm coming I'm coming now. Okay. Hello, are we back? We are, we are back. Oh gosh, we're really sorry about all those technical problems we had earlier. Have you? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you see, I've got a little worry monster. That's who I tell when I have troubles. So I'm going to do a little bit of a talk on mindfulness and now and meditation. So, should we go in the other room? Yes. Okay. We're going, we're going we're going into the other tent now so if you'd like to come with us next door <laughs> see you shortly Welcome back to the other tent. Although I don't know how bad you You don't want to see how light it is. Okay. Right. We're just going to take a minute now. I don't know about you, but when life gets a bit too stressful, I tend to think it's time to pause and have a little bit of a breathing space. And that's what mindfulness is all about. So, uh, hmm. Let's just take a minute and chill. Right. Our brain, this, um, our brain, is a very complex thing, isn't it? Always planning, doing, worrying, thinking, organizing. We have so much to do when we're uh, going through our normal day. And, um, I'm just going to ask you all, how are you feeling right now with the aid of my little bag of mystery? So this little bit of a festival is aimed for families and, you know, young people. So I'm not sure who we've got watching, but I wonder how you're feeling. You're feeling, ooh, what have I got in my bag? Ooh, ooh, are you happy? Look, we've got little Miss, little Miss Happy here. And we've got, oh, he's so funny. Anybody feeling funny? Anybody got any jokes for us? Please put some in the chat room. And, oh, hopefully I'm going to call some people here. Mm. What else have I got? Oh, he's feeling a bit shy. feelings. Well, I'm going to do a short little meditation now to help us think about those feelings that we've got churning up and going all around us. So if you'd like to put your feet on the ground and just make yourself comfortable and close your eyes and I'm going to lead us through a short meditation. And we'll begin and end with a bell.
as we begin, take a moment to arrive. Being here now, settling down into the chair, being aware of your surroundings, and then closing your eyes and taking a few minutes to check in with yourself. How are you feeling right now? Where is your attention? What do you notice? We're going to move on now to the breath. And without trying to change anything, simply observe the rhythm of the breath as it comes and goes. Follow the journey of the breath. Move down into your chest, down to the abdomen, expanding the belly, notice if the air is released through the nose or the mouth, breathing in, Breathing out. Now, when you're ready, move your attention away from the body and to the breath sound and hearing. We're going to spend some time now noticing sounds as they arrive and then dissolve. Being with the sounds in your own body. Without making an effort, see if you can notice your own heartbeat, your breath, or anything else that calls to your attention. Then widen your awareness to the room as a whole. What sounds do you notice now? Sounds from within the room. And further into the distance. Try not to label these sounds, whether you like them or not. Maybe a sound will trigger a thought. Try to let go of this and simply notice the sound for its own quality the pitch and the duration.
Try not to give meaning to the sounds. Just allow them to come and go. As we move on, we're going to let go of paying attention to sound. And just allow some thoughts to arise in the mind. The mind is always thinking about something and wants to have attention moving from thought to thought, planning, doing, worrying. Take some time in the silence to attend to these thoughts. Notice that they arise, stay around, then dissolve, replaced by a new thought or an idea. See if you can follow each train of thought. There's no need to try and change anything or label anything. Just allow these thoughts to come and go. It may be helpful to see these thoughts as clouds floating across the sky, some bigger than others, some dark, some light. Watch as they float into sight, drift across, then disappear from view. Now, as we bring this meditation to a close, return once more to the breath. And allow your mind to let go of all thoughts and refocus your attention into the body, into your breath, as you breathe in and out. Then slowly, when you are ready, open your eyes as you move on with your day. Thank you. we're all feeling a bit more centered now a bit more relaxed and um festival's going to continue and uh hopefully a bit more smoothly as we move on and we're going to be we're going to be getting ready for the open mic that will be starting next yes we shall be uh, uh getting ready for the open mic uh, but as I was saying uh, before, campaign workshop, uh, we will be getting uh, all the thoughts we've got here. Well, I know you to sign up by doing that. Sorry, we've got the thoughts here. Yeah, but that might be quite a lot. Anyway, we're we, we starting oh. the open mic. Uh, half past one, so just half half one, so, uh, half an hour to go. And, um, We'll see you then. Yes. Go and grab yourself a bit of a snack and uh, we'll see you shortly. Okay. Bye. Bye.
Right. We're back. Oh, I think we are. Oh, you had a chance to get something to eat. Been down to the beer tent. Don't know, whatever else. Got a burger off the barbecue. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Well, what have we got for you now? We have got a lovely open mic. And as I say, lots of people have contributed to this and I'm really looking forward to it. And I hope we don't have any more technical problems, but I can't promise. So um, I found a microphone anyway, so that's exciting, isn't it? So who have we got first? I think we have got... Martha Evans. The Martha Evans, and she is a virtuoso violinist. So a great start. Viola, viola, viola player. Sorry, my mistake. It's like a violin, but better. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, I hope I've got a good picture there. So, are we ready, Mr. Technical Man? I don't know. Or do I need Probably to waffle? have a go. <laughs> do I need to waffle some more? Okay. It's not quite half past. So we could waffle. Some not, more. We could waffle some more actually, because some people might still be uh, queuing at the beer tent, mightn't they? Yes. Mentioning no names. Mr. Goodwin. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so what can we tell you about this afternoon? Let's have a look. Ah, now I know some of you, you know, these sort of festivals, even though they're online, they still cost money. And um, we have been very great, grateful for some funding that we've received. Um, right. Let's, let's, let's just read this statement. <laughs> we were hoping for a sunny weekend in St Hilda's grounds. Instead, we are together nonetheless. If, and if it has to be online with the support of the Celebrate National Lottery 25 Fund, which is helping bring communities together, celebrating 25 years of the National Lottery. That's good, isn't it? So we've had some funding from the National Lottery, even though we you know, sadly, none of us, well, I still haven't managed to become a millionaire yet, but we've got some funding from the National Lottery. And we would also like to thank all of the artists who have given up their time and talents and all who have in any way come together to help put this festival together. Now, if you look in the comments section, I know um, there's a link there for anybody who feels they would like to contribute. Um, because as I say, we've, um, we've had certain expenses to put this festival on. So if you are in a position to help out with any donations, they will be very gratefully received, no matter how small or large. <laughs> okay. So yeah, there's the link. Um, oh, I can't be reading that out. You just have to click on it's it. On but it's on the comments anyway, yes. And we really value your comments. You know, if you want to tell us how it's going and what we're doing, that's be exciting. It's um, good. To, it's good to see that we've got people coming from uh, watching this from uh, quite a long way away. Yes. Can uh, I be bigger on this screen, actually? Do you, do you want to be bigger? I can be. I think sure I could be bigger if I if we tried. Ah, look, there you go. <laughs> I am bigger now. And um, yeah, we need to move some of those things out of the background there. We don't want people to get distracted. Um, so, uh, oh, are you coming in properly, dear? I could come in properly. Yes, you could. Oh, there's my shoulder. There's your shoulder and there's the rest of him. <laughs> hello, hello. Oh, look, look, nice and bright and colourful. Have you got your festival clothes on? Yes, I thought I'd dress up, even though I've got nowhere to go. Well, I hope you're all joining in. Yes, exactly. Dressing up. Oh, yeah, all dressing up. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Even dyed my hair. Ready. Yes. So, is it? Oh, we're on the yes, countdown. We've, we've, we've got, we've we've got, got, got people come from um, uh, Coventry. Coventry. We have someone from Swansea. Do we? Yes, Swansea, the lovely Shay is checking in from South Wales. And mm. uh, yeah, hello. Bourneville, Sturchley. Yeah, let's say hello to a few people, shall we? Um, Do let's. Avonlea and Apples. Oh, interesting, whoever that is. Nice name you've got for yourself there. We've got Isles Mason. Um, Alice, Laura, Alice Lewis, Chris Barker. Ooh, anybody else joining in? Well, if you want a mention or a shout out, put, a, put something in the comments. Uh, I, I think there was, uh, there was a couple from uh, near Bridge End. 
earlier I saw in the comments. Oh, was there? Yeah, Excellent. It was. Yeah, little village Right then, so say a little prayer. And we'll have a go. And we'll have a go. All right, so let's sit back and enjoy the lovely Martha. So we're going to kick off, kick off with Martha. Martha Evans. Oh, sorry, we've got the wrong one here. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm back. And he's just sorting out a few more technicals again. Oh, dear. Come back next year. We'll be ready <laughs> for you. <laughs> yes. Oh, right. Right. Just need to get the right one set up. Yes, we're looking for Martha, dear. She's obviously still getting her. She's obviously got her stuck in a queue somewhere. Anyway, good job I'm here to entertain you, isn't it? It is indeed. It is. Good job I'm here. Dear, oh dear. Would have been in Glastonbury, but you know, sadly they got cancelled. That's not what we want either, darling. That's the lovely John Barber. What's going on? Oh. Hello. Where did John Barber come from? I don't know. I'm trying not to get irritating with him, but it's a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's got stuck. Oh dear. I know, we're trying. Martha's just tuning up. Yes, she is. Amber says hello. Amber says hello. Oh, oh yeah, Sam, Sam's just called in as well. Right. Have we? Can we find Martha? Please say, can we find yeah, Martha? There's Martha. There she is. We've managed to drag her out of the uh, beer tent. And she's going to be with us ever so shortly, isn't she? Well, I hope so. Right. He's still doing stuff. Oh, right. I've got to step back from the camera, apparently. Oh. I'm having complaints from the audience. <laughs> Right, what's the problem, Mr. Lewis? Honestly. We're going to get uh, getting, uh, Mr. Barber on. Right. Okay. Oh, the sun's coming. Come, the sun's a bit strong, isn't it? Right. Okay. What do you call a fly with no wings? I don't know. What do you call a fly with no wings? A walk. Boom, boom. Okay. Uh. <laughs> okay. Oh, my. Let me think. Any more jokes? I can. Do we know any more jokes? Oh, I don't think we do. Uh, do we not? Mm. Yeah. What did the big chimney say to the little chimney? You're too you're, young. You're too young to smoke. You're too young to smoke. Oh, these were the jokes we used to tell when I was... when I were a lad. Back in the day. And here we are. I, do you think we've found? Do you think we're ready now? Yeah. Are we really ready? I don't want, I don't want to get people too uh, excited. Okay, I'm off. <laughs>
Wow. Thank you so much to Martha for that beautiful performance from the viola. And uh, what have we got next? We've got Alice Round. Now, this is a lovely young lady with a beautiful singing voice, very local here. And I'm sure some of you already know her, but for anyone who hasn't, you're in for a treat. So, we ready to go? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> And we were doing so well, weren't we? Oh, excuse us. No, I just want to make a correction there in the running order. We've got Lysio coming up next. So, um, oh, there we go. Gonna have to watch, see what's going on backstage. There you go. See how much work we've been putting in? Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sit back and enjoy Lysio. We just need to make it full screen. There you go. And this is Lysio. Where, where are they from? The lo local group. Local group. I'll try and tell you a bit more about them and their performance. Thank you.
what we're doing and take a breather, shall we? Right, now that, we've just been listening to the beautiful Alice Round and she's sang um, No Time To Die and, um, and I'll Fly Away. And you will have noticed the images there were a combination from uh, Birmingham and um, out on the Long Mind, which I had a chance to go out for a lovely walk. If you don't get to, honestly, one thing about this lockdown experience is we've all had a chance to um, find new places, haven't we? And one of the places I went for the first time, can you believe, and it's only just down the road from us, it was the Long Mind and up to the Stipper Stones. So I can highly recommend that now that we've got the opportunity to get out and about. So, um, but right now, just, so I'm absolutely certain we've got Lickio. So you've just listened to the lovely Alice Round and now here we go with a video from Lickio and their lovely music. Thank you.
Ooh. Right, can you make me bigger again? Oh, look, time for a new outfit. And we've gone down the beach. Actually, avoid going down the beach. Tell me it's very crowded. Well, thank you to Lickio. That all was beautiful. And some more haunting images of Birmingham during the lockdown. And um, yeah, it's been a long 14 weeks, hasn't it? So, uh, but our performances continue. And oh, we have got a lovely treat now. The chair of our committee is going to perform for you now, the lovely John Barber, who's an, a very accomplished and uh, local celebrity here in the West Midlands. So uh, we're- And friends. And friends, yes. Um, they're gonna be joining in and they're gonna be playing some music on the piano for us. So yes, changing the tempo slightly now. And let's hope it works. <laughs> Hi, my name is John Barber. I'm a musician in Bellwood in Birmingham. I've got three pieces to show you today. The first two I'm going to play joint with my friends Jane and Paul Edwards, um, two great songs which they will introduce. And then thirdly, uh, I'll be performing a track of my own called 2020. And obviously it's a track all about the last three or four months. Hope you enjoy. Hello again. Uh, we're going to travel to uh, the Mediterranean today. Corsica is an island in the Mediterranean that's uh, largely overlooked by the British uh, holiday maker. Uh, this is a, a song I wrote a few years ago and it, uh, it relates to a journey I made there in 2004. The very southern tip of the island is a very spectacular old maritime sea town called Bonifacio on the cliffs and it has a lower harbour and seven, eight miles away across the Straits of Bonifacio is the island of Sardinia. I tend to remember the atmosphere of the place and thinking about all the shipping that's passed through those straits over hundreds of years, uh, cargoes on the way through to um, Italy from Spain and France and all those possible shipwrecks and um, Bonifacio today still carries some atmosphere of, um, uh, of the, its heritage and ghostly comings and goings, so I uh, hope you like this one. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we've got our keyboard player with us today, socially distancing of course, um, yeah. joining in. Um, that would be, be lovely. So, uh, John Barber in Distant Bearwood. Sand moon in the fire of two dogs by 
was uh, a vase one at uh, Bob Wilson's Fun Fair on Billsley Common and it stayed on our mantelpiece for many years but uh, in its uh, lifetime it probably never had any flowers in it, it just became a, a dumping ground for odds and ends and uh, uh, one of those one of those places it, everybody's got one of those places in their house it can be a drawer it can be an old cupboard some people's whole house is like an old yellow vase so. and this is for uh, well this is a request for my two daughters Katie and Sarah Hope you enjoy it. There's no yellow vase on a wooden shelf that I place the things that should be somewhere else. Smoke keeps sakes and curiosities. I should do the sky yet somehow keep. I think it's gonna crack, I think, I think it's, it's gonna break. There's too much light and too little space. I think it's gonna burst. You get more love when your heart says stop. There are small colored shells, no bunch of a cold pair of quotes for poems. That is you, lateral thoughts, cryptic clues, kisses on the window, sent by you. Says no. There's a piece of a puzzle and a sorry to pick the monopoly food and the scrabble was said. A lucky charm of a kangaroo, a fool of a pellet with eyes like you. Tickets from the county fair, raffle stubs for that bowl of air, the last day ring for the blue city, and rivers that tumbled out for me. I think it's gonna crack, I think it's gonna break, there's too much love and too little space. I think it's gonna burst and somehow pop. Where'd you fit more love when your heart says stop? And I think it's gonna crack, I think it's gonna break, there's too much love and too little space. 
But you flip more love when your heart says stop. Flip more love when your heart says stop. Flip more love when your heart says stop. Gosh, I was, ooh, I'm echoing again. <laughs> I'm quite, I'm quite speechless after those, that, 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 that performance. And also it's not just the, the music. Oh, I seem to have developed an echo. Why, why have I developed an echo, dear? Yeah, no. Right, let's, there, okay. Right, can we mute over there? Right, I think, I think that's a bit better. Right, wow, yes, I've quite left quite speechless. Thank you, John and Paul. And, um, oh my gosh, who's the other lady that was, um, 
I've forgotten the name. Sorry, forgotten the name. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for those beautiful performances. Like I say, I really got uh, quite caught up in that and that was lovely. But we've got, we've got to move on. That was beautiful. And we've got uh, another member of our committee performing for us now with some more interesting videos. Um, yeah, it's been a lot of work, as I say, that's been going on behind the scenes for the last, well, last couple of months, to be honest with you. And I really just want to thank everybody who's contributed to these, to this event. Um, there's so many names and we're hoping that everybody, you know, we, we plan to sort of credit everybody at the end, but, but thank you. Thank you to, we've had Lysio and we've had Alice and Martha and that was John and uh, friends. And now we've got the wonderful John Goodwin ready to play for you. So again, enjoy, ladies and gentlemen. I give you John Goodwin. Jim Weatherly in 1973. Um, would it have been a big hit that it was for Gladys Knight and the Pips if it hadn't changed titles to Midnight Train to Georgia in 1976? The version was slowed down by Neil Diamond for his album Dreams and this is the version I will sing here.
that midnight train to Georgia I'd rather live in her world Than be without her in mine Georgia I'd rather live in her world than be without her in mine Yes I would Yes I Many people believe that the song For Once In My Life was a Stevie Wonder song, but although he recorded it in 1968, it was first recorded in 1965. It was written and first recorded as a slow ballad and not the up-tempo version that Wonder recorded three years later. Once in my life, I got someone who needs me, someone I've needed so long. For once, unafraid, I can go where life leads me, and somehow I know I'll be strong. For once, I can touch what my heart used to dream of long before I knew. Someone warm like you Could make my dreams come true For once in my life I won't let sorrow hurt me Not like it's hurt me before For once I have someone I know won't desert me I'm not alone anymore for once I can say, this is mine, you can take it As long as I know I've got love, I can make it For once in my life, I've got someone who needs me him I say this is mine you can take it as long as I know I've got love I can make it for once in my life I've got someone for once in my life I've got someone for once in my life I've got someone who needs me The song The Way You Look Tonight would be a wonderful way for a, a young male to woo any female that took his fancy. It's a song that uh, was from the film Swing Time that was performed by Fred Astaire and composed by Jerome Kern with lyrics written by Dorothy Fields. It won the Academy Award for Best Original Song in 1936. In the movie, Astaire sang the song to Ginger Rogers while she was washing her hair in an adjacent room. Low. 
When the world is cold I will feel a glow Just thinking of you And the way you look Tonight Your love Your smile so warm And your cheeks so soft There is nothing for me But to love you And the way you look Tonight Each word, your tenderness grows, tearing my fears apart. And that laugh that wrinkles your nose and touches my foolish heart. Yes, you're lovely Never ever change Keep that breathless charm Won't you please arrange it Cause I love you Just the way you look Tonight you John that was a very nice mellow sound and uh, we love that wow we've we made it through the first half which is quite an achievement and we're still talking to each other <laughs> yeah I'm still here yeah he's still here you know and wow we've got lots of people to say thank you to haven't we all the wonderful contributors to our open mic we've had Martha Evans to begin with, then we had Lysio, then we had, sorry, we had Alice Round and Lysio. Lysio. 
Licio. And um, Licio, sorry. Licio. I can't sorry. read. <laughs> sorry, just ignore him. Right, and then we've got John Barber, Paul and Jane, and finishing off with John Goodwin. Wow, that was an amazing lineup of talent. And uh, yes, and did I mention Paul Hodgetts at the beginning? Yes. Um, thank you again for that wonderful organ recital. So what have we got next? We've got a little breather, I think. We've got a couple of minutes while we get ready and set up for the next thing this afternoon, which will be Andy Swinford. He will be with us shortly. We're just going to take a short break. Um, and like I say, if you do want to contribute to you know, the costs or anything from this festival, all donations welcome. There is a link in the comments. And uh, yeah, we're just saying thank you to the lottery as well, who've given us some funding for this wonderful festival, the Three Shires Festival, which is in its third year. And we really hope that we're gonna be able to do this live on grass and somewhere sunny next year. So, you know, keep in touch with us um, because we want this festival to build and uh, we think it's got a real potential. Okay, so grab yourself a cup of tea, literally don't go anywhere, just a couple of minutes while we get ourselves sorted. And then we've got Andy Swimford. And I wonder if I should just say a little bit about what we've got coming up. This again is our workshop. And um, Andy's gonna be talk talking to us about Gosh, my brain's gone talking, talking and C.S. Lewis and the natural world. And uh, Andy, well, I'll, I'll say a little bit more when you can see him. So uh, just to say, come back, give, grab yourself a cup of tea, hop to the toilet and be back here within a few minutes. All right. Thank you. Hi Andy. Hello Dave. Sorry about the delay there. Right, um, you, you, you all happy? And... Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be happy when it's underway. <laughs> That's yeah. good. Everything should be fine. <laughs> Right. Um, well, if, if you're ready, we'll... Um, Let's just have a minute. Oh. Let him in so we can say hello. Oh, before we, yeah. Before we pin the video. Yes, put, put your video let's, on. And, uh, let's, let's, let's get him ready, and then we can just turn the video on. 
see in the room, yeah. I'm going to plug that straight in while we're not getting knocked. Right, so he's in the room. In the room. Oh, Well, welcome back. We're getting there slowly. <laughs> my life, this is this is the hardest my brain's had to work for a long time, you see. I, I've been working from home and taking it easy. So my brain's gone a little bit mushy. But hopefully Andy's hasn't. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, can we test your your Microphone working, Andy. Can we hear can you? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, can't we? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so Andy's going to be talking to us, as I say, about Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and the natural world. And I'm going to have a well earned rest and I'm going to sit back and hopefully learn something new and along with everybody else. So I'm going to disappear and hand you over to Andy. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining me. I just want to talk a little bit about the importance of the natural world to the two great fathers of fantasy writing, uh, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Um, the two of them became fast friends when they were both teaching in Oxford University around 1924. And uh, I think without Lewis, Tolkien may never have got Lord of the Rings finished because uh, it took so it took him so long, about 40 years from the first piece of writing to publication. And C.S. Lewis gave him a lot of encouragement. Um, and they used to read their work at meetings of friends called the Inklings uh, in the pub in Oxford. And C.S. Lewis, he loved Lord of the Rings. He said it came like lightning from a clear sky. Uh, I'm afraid Tolkien was rather disparaging about Narnia though. Uh, but both were published around the same time in, in the early 50s. Tolkien and Lewis had a number of things in common and their love of the natural world is one of the most important when you look at Lord of the Rings and the Narnia stories, which is what I'm going to focus on this afternoon. Uh, we, we can only scrape the surface really, so I, I'm going to look at nature as opposed to industrial nightmare <laughs> in their work. Uh, we'll look at trees and woods in particular and finish on a high with mountains. Uh, but I want to start by showing a clip from the film of The Hobbit with Bilbo leaving Hobbiton, which shows that the kind of pastoral idyll, which was the Shire and which Tolkien loved, and was rooted in his own childhood experiences of the Midlands countryside, as we'll see, uh, although this was filmed in, in New Zealand. Sorry, I think you probably have no sound, so I'm going to start that again. Oh, <laughs> 
literature. Uh, Tolkien was, was steeped in the countryside from a, a very early age. Um, from the age of four to nine, he lived and played near Sparehole Mill uh, in Birmingham. Uh, and at one time, there were more than 50 water mills in Birmingham. Uh, Sarehole here is, is the, the last surviving example. Uh, and he and his brother would spend many hours roaming the meadow around here and around the River Cole. The River Cole winds along, often through dark, overhung places, occasionally flanked by slender willows. Uh, and the streams and rivers in Tolkien's books were often flanked by leaning trees, especially alders and willows. So I think this, this whole area with its many streams and maybe later the Cherwell as well in Oxford is, is the prototype on the Cherwell for the old, old man willow perhaps. Uh, and these places no, no doubt fed Tolkien's love of running water, which is found in the novels, uh, the, the enchanted stream of Mirkwood, the withy windle in the old forest, the silver load in Lothlorien and so on. And when he lived here at Fairhall, the Wake Green Road was, it was a quiet, slightly winding country lane lined by cornfields and meadows and hedgerows and bluebells. It was a peaceful rural scene, no traffic noise. If you stood here in 1896 with the four-year-old Tolkien, uh, you'd see no other buildings apart from the mill and this small group of Victorian semis, which he called cottages. Uh, uh, and they lived in one of these. And Hall Green, now a big suburb of Birmingham, was just a little village across the fields. And maybe just the old passing farmers or tradesmen's cart, and maybe the occasional dwarf driving a cartload of fireworks. And Tolkien described the area around the hamlet of Sarehall as a kind of lost paradise. Uh, in a newspaper interview much later in his life, he said, I could draw you a map of every inch of it. I loved it with an intensity of love that was a kind of nostalgia reversed. And he did draw a map. This, this, this map he drew of Hobbiton could easily be based on the area. You know, everything's in more or less the right place. Tolkien said that this part of Warwickshire was Warwickshire then, uh, with its meadows and streams and farms. It was very much, much like what he envisaged the Shire to be. And here the Hobbit folk lived in a quiet life. Uh, they liked to be left undisturbed in their corner of Middle Earth, east of the sea, many leagues west of the, the Misty Mountains. And they were more interested in cabbages and potatoes than elves and dragons and adventure. A simple water mill was as technological as they got. Tolkien's mother educated her two sons at home uh, and at this time. And by the time he arrived here, age four, Tolkien was already reading. And she taught him botany and encouraged an early interest in, in the details of flora and fauna that you find just everywhere in the Lord of the Rings. Uh, and so, for example, as well as plant life known to you and me, he, he invented plants like athalas, otherwise known as king's foil, the healing herb that Aragorn used to soothe the wound Frodo gets from the dark riders on Weathertop. And Eleanor, the sun star, the little golden flower in the grass of Lothlorien. And when the quest was over, the Hobbit Mary wrote a book called Herb Lore of the Shire, including a particular focus on pipe weed. Hobbits enjoyed their pipes, as did Tolkien himself, and for that matter, Lewis did as well, and Gandalf, of course. And C.S. Lewis was also steeped in nature and the countryside. This is the Kilns where he lived for many years on the edge of Oxford. It had an eight acre garden. This lake was part of the garden, it was in the back garden. Uh, it's now a nature reserve owned by the council, but you can go and walk there. And there's a path up through it, uh, which goes up to shot over hill uh, on the edge of Oxford where he took the dogs for many walks. And he'd go walking in the country around Oxford. And for many years, he went on one or two long walking tours a year, many different parts of England and Ireland uh, with his friends. And they often took in Malvern, including one trip with his brother and Tolkien, Tollers, they called him. But Tollers called them ruthless walkers. <laughs> he stuck it for two days and he went home. Uh, and there's, there's a plaque on the pub there. Uh, his had a few connections with Malvern. He, he went to boarding school there. Uh, and at the beginning of Out of the Silent Planet, which is one of his space trilogy, uh, the main character, Ransom, is enjoying a long hike in the country. 
and he meets an old acquaintance who just doesn't get it at all. He says, do you do it for money or is it sheer masochism? Which immediately marks him out as a bad character, of course. At first, Lewis enjoyed looking for scenes in the countryside that might have come out of the, the books that he read, stories of North mythology in particular. Uh, but he says in his autobiography, uh, when he was 13 and at prep school in Malvern, nature ceased to be a reminder of the books and became a medium of the joy. And he, he thought of the, the, the beauties of nature uh, were a, a secret that God has shared with us alone. And he, he says, that he reckoned that the angels don't have bodies like ours, so they can't really appreciate nature like we do with our retinas and our palettes. Uh, in another of the space trilogy, that, that hideous strength, uh, the first thing we're told about the character Mark uh, is that he isn't noticing the beauty of the morning as he walks to college. And that's, that's a black mark against his character from the start. Tolkien and Lewis create pre-industrial worlds. This is very important to both of them. They relish the world of nature. Unspoilt nature often reflects a, a moral and spiritual goodness. In The Lord of the Rings, on the other hand, Sauron destroys natural goodness. The elf Galdor said Sauron can torture and destroy the very hills. And then in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by Lewis, Edmund is full of bitterness and spite on the way to the White Witch to, to betray his brother and sister. He fantasizes that when she's made him king, he will make some decent roads. He'll have cars and railways and cinemas. It's only later that he learns to notice and, and to love nature. In The Magician's Nephew, after Aslan sung the beautiful, pristine, natural Narnia into being, Uncle Andrew wants to introduce industry to Narnia. He sees that, that when the witch throws a lump of iron that she's ripped off the lamppost back at home in London, at Aslan, it, it falls to the ground and a lamppost grows from it. So he becomes interested in the commercial possibilities of, of burying old bits of scrap metal and selling the result back home. You know, train engines, battleships, that sort of thing. Uh, and the air in Narnia makes him feel so young, he wants us to turn it into a health resort. He'll be rich. So nature and industry are often pitted against each other. When Tolkien passed Sir Hole Mill on a visit to relatives in 1933, he was 41 at the time, and in the middle of writing The Hobbit, and he was just horrified to find the quiet lanes of his childhood dangerous with traffic. The elm trees destroyed, the miller's house had been replaced by a petrol station, uh, and a lot of hateful red brick houses built. He didn't like red brick. Uh, and the fields all swallowed up by the ever expanding city of Birmingham. And there, there are obvious parallels with the end of the Lord of the Rings, and many of the hobbit holes have been burned or destroyed or demolished, including Bagshot Row and Sam's old home and rows of ugly, badly built houses have been built, not, not with that lovely traditional Hobbit style of round windows, but with narrow rectangular ones and spiked gates. And uh, by, by the, the bywater pool, we're told, uh, the pleasant row of old Hobbit holes in the bank on the north side of the pool were deserted. And their little gardens that used to run down bright to the water's edge were, were rank with weeds. And that, that's not an insignificant detail about the gardens, because gardens are an important motif uh, that run right through Lord of the Rings. And sadly, at Bag End, Bilbo and Frodo's old home, uh, the garden's been trashed and outhouses put up all over it and the, the hobbit hole's been ruined. And they're dismayed when they see a large red brick chimney belching out black smoke in place of the mill, with noisy hammering and smoke and reeking smells and fouling the stream right down to the Brandywine River. And it, it makes it like a miniature Isengard, which the, the corrupt wizard Saruman had ruined, and which in turn is, is, is a smaller version of Mordor itself, with its smokes and fiery pits where Sauron prepares his engines of war. Uh, and indeed, the Hobbiton Mill turns out to be run now by Saruman, uh, otherwise known as Sharky. Uh, and Frodo says, this is Mordor. 
Tolkien's uh, mother moved to Oliver Road in Birmingham. Uh, very near Edgbaston Reservoir in 1902, and uh, Tolkien was 10. And northeast of the reservoir at the time was a heavily industrialized landscape, with numerous factories manufacturing everything from spoons to stove varnish. There were mills for rolling metal. Um, the Bellis and Morecambe Iron Foundry that you can see here is producing steam engines and boilers. Uh, in 1906, while Tolkien lived here, they created the first successful steam turbine. And there were glass works and the huge Atlas works making bed frames and mattresses, brassware factory, the Birmingham Mint, which made coins for over 100 countries. Uh, and there were sawmills and breweries and coal merchants and the railway with its steam trains and coal yards. You know, Sarehole, Hobbiton, it ain't. <laughs> Uh, so east of the reservoir, smoke poured out from the forest of factory chimneys and uh, making thick smogs and stench. Uh, the boiler house uh, of Edgbaston Reservoir had two or three large steam-driven pumping engines which drew water from boreholes to, to supply Birmingham. And great loads of coal would have been brought from the canals to feed the boilers. And there would have been dense clouds of black smoke pumping into the sky and the, the noise of the engines reverberating all day. All day. Uh, today, the, the towers are a grade two listed building. Fifty years before, um, Charles Dickens had described Birmingham, uh, the din of hammers, the rushing of steam, and the dead, heavy clanking of engines with the harsh music which arose from every quarter. Uh, and he describes the glare in the sky, flickering now and then over the great furnaces. Ton tongues of flame shoot up from them, and pillars of fire turn and twist upon them. He might easily have been des de describing Mordor or Saruman's Isengard. An American consul famously said that Birmingham was black by day and red by night. I ought to say at this point that Birmingham actually today isn't that bad. <laughs> uh, uh, but the, co the corruption of Saruman, the wizard gone bad, um, is reflected in, in the smoking uh, the industrial mess that he'd made of Isengard. Once it had been a lovely fertile valley, and now it's gone to ruin, all weeds and brambles where there used to be groves and avenues of ancient trees. And, and for a mile uh, around Saruman's Black Tower, not a single green thing grows. Uh, but there's just smokes and steams emerging from, from underground, and lots of ugly buildings and roads and shafts sunk in the ground, with domes of stone over them that look like a, a graveyard of the unquiet dead. And we're told, I'll read it to you, the ground trembled. The ground trembled, the shafts ran down by many slopes and spiral stairs to caverns far under. There Saruman had treasures, storehouses, armories, smithies and great furnaces. Iron wheels revolved there endlessly and hammers thudded. At night time, plumes of vapour steamed from the vents lit from beneath with a red light or blue or venomous green. According to Treebeard, the Ent, Saruman had a mind of metal and wheels. Uh, he does not care for growing things. Uh, and this brief clip that I want to show you gives you the general idea from one of the films. Mordor is worse, <laughs> and its immediate surroundings are, uh, it says, a land defiled, diseased beyond all healing. And at the gate of Mordor, uh, it says, here nothing lived, not even the leprous growths that fed on rottenness. The gasping pools were choked with ash and crawling mud, sickly white and grey, as if the mountains had vomited the filth of their entrails upon the lands about. 
high mounds of crushed and powdered rock, great cones of earth, fire blasted and poison stained, stood like an obscene graveyard in endless rows, slowly revealed in the reluctant light. Sounds very like a very sick person, leprous growth, gasping pools, choked with ash, mountains vomiting the filth of their entrails. Nature has been poisoned. Mordor is called a dying land, a forsaken land, a hateful land, with always a place of shadow and smokes and red glare, a sullen gloom. Tolkien repeatedly uses the word sullen uh, when he's describing the light. Often the sun is an apocalyptic red, and at the last battle, It says the sun now climbing towards the south was veiled in the reeks of Mordor and through the, ha the threatening haze it gleamed remote, a sullen red, as if it were the ending of the day or the end maybe of all the world of light. And out of the gathering murk the Nazgul came with their cold voices crying words of death and then all hope was quenched. Let's, uh, let's, let's go to Lewis for a little light relief, shall we? <laughs> um, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe uh, begins during the Blitz, which was a recent memory for Lewis when he was writing the novel. Uh, and the Pevensey children are sent away from London to a very remote house in the heart of the country. Uh, and it marks the beginning of the, the town and country divide in the Chronicles that, that follows a, a long literary tradition. Uh, Lewis has a very romantic love of nature, a, a rejection of the city. And the children coming from the city, they get very excited about the countryside. You might find anything in a place like this. Did you see those mountains as we came along? And the woods? There might be eagles. There might be stags. There'll be hawks. Badgers, says Lucy. Foxes, said Edmund. Rabbits, said Susan. And in The Magician's Nephew, Digri is sent to London so that his sick mother can be looked after by Aunt Letty and Uncle Andrew, and he hates it. <coughs> you'd cry, he tells Polly, if you'd lived all your life in the country and had a pony and a river at the bottom of the garden, and then been brought to live in a beastly hole like this. And at the, the exact midpoint of the novel, uh, there's a transition from cities, John and London, where the story's been set so far, to the countryside, Narnia, where the second half of the book takes place. Let's have a look. Charm. <clears throat> Charm is, is the world of the witch Jadis, which she has destroyed with her magic. Uh, there's no plants living in Charm. All that's left are withered stems let alone animal life, not even an ant. Uh, it's a place of death. Uh, and this dying world contrasts with the fresh, vibrant life and growth in the, the newly created Narnian world in the second half of the book. Snow. Well, snow is part of the magical charm of Narnia in the line The Witch and the Wardrobe. But to the creatures of Narnia, it's a curse, uh, summed up in Mr. Tumnus's famous phrase, always winter, never Christmas. It's an unnatural winter, an enchanted winter. It's silent, no bird song, no voices, because everyone goes about with fear. C.S. Lewis's delight in nature comes through in the description of the new springtime, which follows the witch's enchanted winter. And you see it first through the eyes of Edmund as the, the witch tries to force her sledge through an increasing thaw. Uh, one of what I think is one of the loveliest passages in the whole Narnia series. Uh, first comes the lilting music of babbling streams you know, when there was only ice before. That makes even the traitor Edmund's heart leap. And there's warm sunlight. There are spring flowers, bright celandines, crocuses, primroses, and snowdrops. And it's all colour, dark green, black, gold, blue, silver, yellow, purple, after that endless white. And the sprouting gold leaves, gold green leaves of the beech trees make the light under them green itself. Uh, and there's a there's birdsong, 
cheerful and loud after the grim silence of the witch's winter until it, it says the whole wood was ringing with birds music. It's all colour and beauty and joy. And Lewis gives over, over four pages of description. Look, there's a kingfisher. I say bluebells. What was that lovely smell? Just listen to that thrush. Here's the thaw as they show it in the movie. spirits of trees and fountains into a deep sleep and wiping out all the old magic and goodness of the place. The kind of ethnic cleansing of Narnia and, and King Mirad presides over a joyless land. Like the White Witch, he's another tyrant. And when at last Narnia is liberated, it happens largely through the medium of nature and the waking of the trees, the sleeping dryads. The whole great crowd of them dance around Aslan, pale birch girls, willow women, beaches, saggy, shaggy oak men, elms, shock-headed hollies, rowans, all bowing and waving and dancing. All nature rejoices. And the whole mad forest of them moves off to Aslan's power against Mirad's men, like the Ents, the tree people do against Saruman and overthrow him in Lord of the Rings. And down at the fords of Varuna becomes a great madcap frenzy of joy when Lucy and Aslan of all people, Bacchus, god of wine and fertility and growth and who knows what else, and his followers, the wild, wild Menads, and with them all the dancing trees cavort their way through Narnia, spreading vines and grapes and ivy and vegetation everywhere they go. The vines spread across and entangle everything. They're even in Lucy's hair, and they feast on the choicest grapes which are suddenly everywhere. It's a mad, mad scene, chaotic and uproarious everywhere they go, with laughing and chasing and leaping. And when they've liber liberated the river god, they come to a school. Now Lewis didn't have good experiences of schools. Uh, Miss Prizzle is teaching history to a class of students who are sporting with sort of tight hair and tight collars and tight stockings. And Gwendolyn uh, is the only one of the children who's swept up into the great dance while the rest of the class flee. And the teacher's desk becomes a rose bush with walls of a, a canopy of leaves. And it is a crazy picture of deliverance from oppression, all done through the goodness of the natural world. And they arrive at Aslan's house just after the Telmarines have been defeated with the help of the woken trees. There's a particular love of trees and woodland in Lord of the Rings and the Narnia book. Uh, in the line of which in the wardrobe, the adventure begins for Lucy inside the wardrobe in the middle of the night, uh, 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 middle of the wood at, at night time. Uh, there's a faint light in the distance, which turns out to be the lamppost, where she meets a form, Mr. Tumnus. And in a way, it's the traditional magic wood that you find in fairy tales. And Lewis's imagination had long been fed on woodland romances by William Morris and George in the 19th century. And when Tumnus tells his tales of Narnia, they're very much stories of the forest, of dryads and the spirits of trees, of, of hunts after the magic stag, dwarfs in caverns beneath the ground, and summer feasting, all in a woodland setting, bonfires and all night dances of fawns and dryads in the heart of the wood. The first two thirds of the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, once the children have got into Narnia, is set in the woods. Uh, then two thirds of the way through, they, they arrive at the hill of the stone table. And only then do they come out of the woods and look down, and it says down on the forest spreading as far as one could see in every direction, except right ahead, where they look down to the sea. In Prince Caspian, 
in a woodland glade by moonlight, Caspian first experiences for real the, the dance of fawns that previously he'd only heard stories of. The truffle hunter, the badger, explains to him, since the humans came into the land, felling forest and defiling streams, the, the dryads and naiads had sunk into a deep sleep. There's some very special nighttime woodland scenes in Prince Caspian. When Lucy wakes one night during their journey through the woods with an odd nighttime dreamish kind of wakefulness, everything's lovely. The moon's bright, creating mysterious shadows and glistening on the creek. The, there are wonderful fragrances, song of the nightingale, vivid memories of talking trees from the old days, and a moment of complete stillness, feeling of being close to some great awakening. It is very like a magic wood. And there's a strangeness about it, the stirring of leaves without wind, the nightingale suddenly hushed, the moment of holiness. And then minutes later, everything back to normal. And the following night, she, she meets Aslan. First, the glade of trees making all the time that queer, lilting, rustling, cool, merry noise. And again, there's moonlight, and Lucy's caught up in the great dance of the trees as she passes through. And there on a lawn, she meets the lion. And the trees for a moment are fully awake in his presence. Tall, graceful, and lovely. In the film, they make it daytime, uh, and this is what it looks like. girl in the last battle calling on King Tyrion for aid. Cruel calamines are murdering the talking trees at Lantern Waste. And her violent death is vivid and tragic when her own trees brought down. And it's all the more shocking because the nymphs of the woods seem to personify all joy in the earlier books. And that shocking sight of the dryad murdered as her tree is felled, followed by a vivid description of the ugly scarring the ancient forest of Lantern Waste. The broad lane had already been opened. It was a hideous lane, like a raw gash in the land, full of muddy ruts where felled trees had been dragged down to the river. Returning to Tolkien at Sayerhole Mill, there was a large willow tree that overhung the edge of the mill pond. And Tolkien used to climb this willow as a boy. He was hugely upset when one day, inexplicably, it was cut down. And the trunk was just left lying there. And the senselessness of it still aggravated him. Years later, and he described it to an interviewer from the Birmingham Post, he, he said, they, they didn't do anything with it. The log just lay there. I never forgot that. It became a symbol for him of wanton destruction in his imagination. Treebeard the Ents, for instance, curses Saruman for felling trees, some of which are just chopped down and left to rot. 
For far from the Shire, in, in, in the forest of Lothlorien, where the High Elves dwell, Sam Ganji gazed into Galadriel's magic mirror and saw Ted Sandyman, the miller, who's always a bit of a light, uh, felling precious trees on the Bywater Road close to the Hobbiton Mill. And when they get back to the Shire at the end of the Lord of the Rings, they're outraged that every tree by the Bywater Warwick Road and along the pool in Bywater has been felled, along with all the chestnut trees by Bagshot Road, where Sam and his gaffer live. Farmer Cotton says, there's no longer even any bad sense to it. They cut down trees and let them lie. They burn houses and build no more. And most gutting of all, they cut down the party tree. Do you remember the great tree in the field opposite Bag End, under which Bilbo stood on a chair to deliver his farewell speech on his 11th, 11th birthday? It was lying locked and dead in the field. Now, forest. Tolkien created several distinct forests in Middle-earth, and close to Sayerholm Mill in, in Birmingham is Mosley Bog. It's called the Dell in Tolkien's time. Uh, and of all the forests and woodland in Tolkien's books, this, this nine hectares of ancient woodland and stream most resembles the old forest uh, to the east of the Shire. Uh, the notice board even welcomes you to the old forest. Uh, it's a site of special scientific interest now, full of rare plants. There's a great feeling of age here. It's one of the last remaining tracts of ancient English woodland. And Tolkien, in his formative years between four and 10, uh, spent long periods of time here. And in this dank, dark, tangled place, it's easy to imagine the malevolent trees of the old forest closing in on you. Um, the old forest is described by Daddy Twofoot at the beginning of Lord of the Rings as dark and bad. And when Frodo's company enter it, they're, they're constantly nervously looking over their shoulders. The trees have dark hearts. Old Man Willow is a vast ancient tree that has evil influence over the whole forest. Pippin and Merry get trapped in the great cracks of his trunk. But Tom Bombadil, with his tall battered hat and his long blue feather, stumps along its paths, totally unaffected by the malevolence of the old forest, and he rescues them. He's more ancient than the mountains, a sort of semi-divine creature present at the creation of Middle-earth. He embodies good nature. And to Tolkien, he, he seemed to represent the spirit of the Oxfordshire countryside that little by little seemed sadly to be disappearing. And then there's the forest of Lothlorien, its extraordinary loveliness sustained by the magic of the elves. Treebeard says it was once known as the land of the Valley of Singing Souls. This is Tolkien's own representation of it. The leaves of the Malorn trees, another invention of Tolkien's, uh, they, they, they turn gold in autumn and they don't fall till the new green opens in spring and the boughs are laden with yellow flowers. And so the floor of the forest is golden and the roof is golden and the trunks are silver. And the elves live on wooden platforms high in the boughs. And though it's winter when Frodo's there, the grass is as green and fragrant as springtime at the beginning of the world and, and, and studded with flowers. And we're told no blemish or sickness or deformity could be seen in anything that grew upon the earth. On the land of Lorien, there was no stain. To Sam, it's like being inside a song. From the hilltop there, they look out over Mirkwood in its growing darkness. And the two forests, Lothlorien and Mirkwood, embody the two powers that are opposed to each other. The great forest of Mirkwood features most in The Hobbit as a dark and dangerous place. Sauron has built a stronghold there and was secretly gathering power. And then further south is Fangorn, it's very ancient. Elrond said it's one of the, the mighty woods of the Elder Days. And near the Ents, tree people like Treebeard. Treebeard says he knows Gandalf, and he's the only wizard that really cares about trees. You can only scratch the surface of these things today. I'd love to talk about the White Tree of Gondor. Uh, or the tree of protection that Vigri planted by the river uh, in Narnia. Um, but I will talk for a moment about mountains. Mountains that fearsome things in Lord of the Rings. They're always barriers to overcome, like 
like the mountain Karadras of Pur, which ultimately defeats the Fellowship of the Ring as they try to cross it. Its sides are dull red, as if stained with blood, we're told, when they start the attempt. Doesn't blow, bode well, really. And the snow and the storm, the rock falls uh, are too much for them in the end. And there's a suspicion that the enemy has a hand in that. It's not for nothing that it's called Karadras the Gruel. Here's a taste of what they do with it in the film. do survive, but they're forced to go under the mountain instead through the mines of Moria, and that's worse actually. Moria is the elvish name, it means black pit, it's a place of death, and it's beneath the mountain that Gandalf, confronting the evil Balrog, is dragged into the abyss. And when he gets to the bottom of the abyss, he plunges into dark water, cold it was as the tide of death, he says later. Almost it froze my heart. And the Balrog is stronger than a strangling snake. He fought far under the living earth. There are many evils there that Gandalf won't talk about. Gandalf and the Balrog wrestle in the depths and on the highest peak of the mountain too, amid thunder and lightning and fire, till eventually the Balrog's overthrown and Gandalf is taken for a time into darkness. He returns not as Gandalf the Grey anymore, but Gandalf the White. There are a lot more mountains in Middle Earth, of course, and a lot often happens at the roots of the mountains. Uh, but I want to turn to Lewis, because for Lewis, mountains have a particular symbolic and spiritual implication. In his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, Lewis writes about the Castle Ray Hills seen from the, his nursery windows at home in Belfast. They, they weren't very far away, uh, but they seemed to him so unattainable. They taught me longing, Sehnsucht, he says, using the German word. And that was before the age of six. The painfully sweet longing, an important concept for Lewis, represented in the stories, especially by, by distant mountains. And he writes in his teens how uh, on the, the hills above Belfast, he loved the view. You could look, one way you looked, you'd see this industrial sprawl of Belfast. A few steps the other, you look out across County Down to the mountains of Morn, blue and transparent in the distance. And it's the distance that's key. It's that sweet, almost painfully sweet desire for a far off country. Here, he says, is the way to the world's end, the land of longing, the breaking and blessing of hearts. So, mountains figure in the novel too. Several novels, <laughs> until, until, our, until we have faces, which was his final novel, uh, the character Psyche says, the sweetest thing in all my life has been a longing to reach the mountain, to find the place where all the beauty came from. And the mountain of Aslan in the silver chair and the northern mountains that Shasta longs for in the horse and his boy, beyond which lies Narnia, land of freedom. And there's a fleeting glimpse of mountains behind the sun in the voyage of the dawn treader at the end as they look through a great wall of shimmering green water to a range of mountains outside the world. 
warm and green and full of forests and waterfalls, however high you look. And a breeze comes with to them, the fragrance and the music that they'll never forget. And they know they're seeing at last into Aslan's own country, that is, into heaven. In The Great Divorce, which was an early novel, uh, Lewis imagines a kind of day trip to the borders of heaven. And one of the characters says, every one of us lives only to journey further and further into the mountains. And in the last battle too, in the inner Narnia, they race ahead to the mountains, farther up and farther in. Mr. Tumnus is showing Lucy the view and she sees the great mountains, which in Aslan's country, and bounding down to them, the lion himself. He comes leaping down the mountains like a cataract of power and beauty, and nothing's ever the same again. But as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them, says Lewis. So I want to, I want to thank everyone for watching today. And uh, I just want to end with a very short clip. Um, you may know that Ian Holm, uh, the actor who played Bilbo in the Land of the Ring, Lord of the Rings film, died just a week ago. Uh, so in tribute to him, here he is at the end of all the stories, uh, preparing to sail with the elves and uh, Gandalf and Frodo to the undying lands beyond the sea. Shire back to the three shires. Right, thank you, Andy. That was You're welcome. Wow, that was really impressive. You're certainly very much better with the technical uh, stuff than we are. That's for start. <laughs> that's for start. That's the slow transitions. I'm working on that. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you very well. I need to put. Oh, how is this going to work? I've got to put my headphones on. But they are coordinated with my dress. <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> oh, right. So I just I don't know whether we've had any questions in the chat, but I've got a I've got a couple that I'd like to. Oh, oh, I've got a couple. Sorry, I'm gonna got a little echo in my my in my ear here. Right. I mean, I suppose my first question was, you know, what, what sort of inspired you this love of literature? This obviously goes a long way back in your life. I think it does, actually. I think it, it, it certainly goes back to the days when my mum used to take me to the local library every Wednesday after school when I was at primary school. And, <laughs> yes. and also, I think my dad, my dad was a local preacher. And he used to be always studying, and we had these bookcases of books, the books on the Song of Solomon and things like that from the Bible, which sort of, I, I think it rubbed off on me, perhaps a bit later in life somehow. Uh, yeah, 
And I, I, always, I, I, I was always getting the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe out of the library. I had it out repeatedly um, when I was, I don't know, about seven or eight, I think. <laughs> Well, I have to confess, I've never actually read The Hobbit, it, but I think I'm going to do it now. <laughs> Glad to have inspired you. Absolutely, you have. So what are the questions have I got here? Right, there's a painting on the wall behind oh, you, you know. and it looks a bit similar to the map of Hobbiton. Is that connected? It's not connected to Hobbiton, actually. It's actually the Malvern. Um, which uh, a friend of mine, Gary Hiscott, painted. Uh, and yeah, it's a famous local landmark. The Malverns, for people who, who maybe don't know, are, are about 50 miles from Birmingham and 60 from Oxford, something like that. It's a, a famous beauty spot. And uh, Lewis went to school there, boarding school, and later liked to walk there. And so it's, it's local, so I, I wanted this painting. And uh, I enjoy it. And mountains mean a lot to me, as they did to Lewis, really. Uh, I find them inspiring and symbolic in my own life, really. Yes. And what about these two towers? Right. Do you uh, know it's true the two towers in Edge West Red Ha are connected to the Lord of the Rings? Yes. Um, you're asking which, what, which are they in the book? Um, well, it's just a, it's a, oh, okay. I'm going to give up on this. <laughs> Honestly, I can't, I've just got too much sound coming in my ear that I can't hear properly. Yeah. But basically, I suppose there's a bit of a myth around Birmingham, you know, you know, and there's a bit of a dispute and some people say, yes, it's connected to Tolkien and others don't. What do you think? Well, people, there's an argument about which of the two, if it is two towers from Lord of the Rings, which two towers are they? And really nobody knows. And, and it seems that uh, even Tolkien himself um, admitted the confusion at, at one time. So I don't know, it's quite, it's quite difficult to tell which they are. So it, it, the, the second volume, The Two Towers, well, it's called The Two Towers, which was possibly more of a publisher's title than, than Tolkien's own choice, I'm not sure. Um, but the, in the first half, the, the obvious tower is Orthanc, which is a Saruman chat tower, a black tower. And in the second half, we're struggling a bit for a more obvious tower. There is a tower uh, by the gate of Mordor where Frodo and Sam attempt, first of all, to get into Mordor. So those could be the two towers. But there, there's other explanations as well. And the truth is, nobody knows. <laughs> no. But I suppose it's convenient for tourism but, but to, yes, it, know, well, in Birmingham, for us to in, claim them for in ourselves. Ed, in Edgbaston, there's the Waterworks Tower, which is a fine Italianate uh, Victorian building, which I said was a, a grade two um, listed building. And nearby, there's, there's a, a Perro, what's called Perro's Folly, it was built as a, as a folly. He thought he could see a long way ahead uh, in the distance. I forget the details now from the top, but, but you can't, so it's called a folly, really. Visitors can go up it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You're, you're muted, Catherine. Sorry, <laughs> I muted myself there, sorry. I was saying, where, where would people start in terms of looking to find out more for themselves about Tolkien and C.S. Lewis? Maybe places to go for a walk or something like that. Where would yeah. you recommend? Well, I, I, I'd recommend going to the Kilns in Oxford. Um, you know, when lockdown is properly lifted, hopefully you're able to go there. It, it, it's owned by uh, an American uh, uh, company uh, now, uh, but you can find the, on the website, you can, you can log in and uh, get a guided tour. And it's well worth doing. When, when I went a few years ago, it was just for a donation. Um, you can go around and have a very interesting talk about, to, uh, um, about Lewis and his life. And then go walking on Shot Over Hill on the, the, in, in, around the, the nature reserve behind it. And uh, it's a lovely day out, actually. And we're going to Oxford, perhaps, and um, take a drink at the, the, the Eagle and Child, where the Inklings used to meet. Um, 
you can go to Magdalen College uh, and uh, go walk around there, um, which is where Lewis was, or Merton College where Tolkien was. There's a number of places that you could go to, and countless books, of course, hundreds of books have been written uh, about the two of them. Oh, thank you for those recommendations. And um, yeah, we'll, yeah, there's somewhere we can add to our list of days out, isn't it? And I'm yes. sure other people are hopefully inspired as well. So I think, I think we can say goodbye to you now. And thank you so oh, much for you. your contributions you. and educating us all and inspiring us all. So if you haven't read the books, I can certainly recommend them yeah. to everybody because um, there's obviously a lot in there. All right. Well, thank you. It's been a great pleasure, Catherine. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Okay, so we'll say goodbye to Andy. Oh, apologises. There were a lot of echoes there. I'm not quite sure what was going on there. So, right, that's our first half of the afternoon. Come to a, a very impressive um, conclusion but we've got more, so don't go away. We've got the second half of our open mic with more local artists, and that's gonna be starting, well, in theory should be starting now at 3.30, uh, but I think we all need a little break. So we're going to have a little break ourselves and we'll be back in about five minutes or so. Yep. Okay, thank you. See, See you soon, soon. don't Bye. go away.
Hello. What? Ooh, we're back. <laughs> I hope you've had a chance to just uh, maybe run to the bathroom or grab yourself a drink or even change your outfit, you know. So <laughs> we've got the open mic coming up now, haven't we? Second we half. So second, second half. What, we, what can we look forward to this afternoon, David? We, we have got, um, we're starting off with the West Park Recorder Group. Um, Sorry, I'm just going to, oh, oh. just need to turn that down. Yes, we're just getting a little bit of that. We we'll know there. what we're doing by the end of this, won't we? We will. We, 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 we can get a job doing this, can we? We might do, you know. Hopefully the BBC will be giving us a call after all this. But, you know, but anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> now, West Park Recorders, uh, they've done uh, several pieces uh, for us. Um, that's followed on by uh, Mike Bainham. Who uh, is singing some uh, some folk, folk music, some of which is himself? Yes. Uh, very, very poignant words there. Um, following on from that, we have Kim Palmer and uh, and Joe, Joe Palmer, her husband, um, and they'll be uh, singing and playing guitar. Yes. And then we end off the open mic session with Matt Goodwin. Uh, Matt is uh, John Goodwin's son, yes. who we heard uh, earlier, and uh, he'll, he'll be uh, on piano and guitar. On I think piano, piano and, and guitar, guitar, I believe. Yes. Yes. Again, I just really want to thank everybody who's taken the time to put these videos together. You know, and we're not experts, so we're we're all having to learn all these new IT skills, aren't we? And people yes. are really you know, put in a lot of effort. So thank you for doing that. And as I say, we want this festival to grow. We want to be doing this again next year. So please like and subscribe our channel. Share it, you know, all these videos are gonna be available afterwards. So if you've missed anything, just go back and you can watch it all again. So uh, yeah, I think, uh, I certainly looking forward to doing that, but shall we get going now with the West Park Recorder Group? And let's pray it gets going. Okay. <laughs> let's have a go. Oh, One moment.
What was he doing? The great god Pan, down in the reeds by the river, spreading ruin and scattering ban, splashing and paddling with hooves of a goat, and breaking the golden lilies afloat with the dragonfly on the river. Hello, we're back. Wow, that was a lovely start to the second half. Oh, I'm feeling very relaxed now. Very, very lovely, Angela, beautiful. I'm just thinking, oh, could you come round and I can just imagine you just playing in my garden. I've got a nice little pond and I've got a nice seat and you can just come and sit there and play to me and I can just be very relaxed. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll have, we'll, have, we'll have to get together and I'm sure there's 
plenty of other people who would like you to come around and play for them. But the whole group was amazing. That was just a lovely start, really beautiful oh, yes. start. Thank you. Thank you for getting our afternoon off. And there's more. Yes, we, we've got somebody else now waiting in the wings. Ah, oh, the wonderful Mike Bainham. Now, again, this is a wonderful musician, um, a local guy, and one of the songs, he's wrote a song called The Carer's Song. And um, Mike himself, I know he wouldn't mind me saying this, he is a carer and, you know, he's been out working all through this, uh, the lockdown and the isolation and keeping people safe and, you know, all these unsung heroes, you know, lots of people have talked about, you know, the key workers that we've got to thank. And I just, I suppose I want to add my thanks to everybody who's yes. been out there on the front line, you know, keeping the country going as it were, the, the health workers, any of you are, um, working in the hospitals or in the shops or carers, whatever you're doing, you know, thank you. Thank you for, for your contribution for us all. So I'm just gonna let Mike play for us now. So enjoy. Is we must pay for from factories to the farmhands to trenches full of mud. War has always been the boss's way, so the union forever defending our rights. Down with the black leg, all workers unite with our brothers and our sisters. Together we will stand. There is power in a union. He's out to cheat us. Police fix for money, the devil for his own. Who comes to speak for the skin and the bone? What a blessing to the widow, a light to the child. There is power in a union. A union forever defending our rights. Down with the black leg, all workers unite. With our brothers and our sisters, together we will stand. There is power. Blackwell Point 
tie faced up the Isle of Dogs. I kissed them off and tenderly and wasted. Heard the bells of Greenwich ringing, flow, sweet river flow. Over time, her heart was singing. Sweet Thames for softly Lighthouse reach I gave her thou Flow, sweet river flow As a ribbon for her hair Sweet Thames flow softly reach we cheek to cheek were dancing the necklace made of London Bridge her beauty was enhancing kissed her once again at Wappen flow sweet river flow after that there was no stopping Sweet Thames flow softly Gave her a Hampton Court to twist Flow, sweet river flow As a bracelet for her wrist Sweet Thames flow softly The tide has changed, my love She has gone from me Winter's blight has touched my heart And put a blight upon me Creeping fog is on the river Flow, sweet river flow Sun and moon and stars gone with her Sweet Thames flow softly Swift the Thames runs to the sea Flow, sweet river flow Bearing ships and part of me Sweet Thames flow softly to see it and wonder why I be It don't matter anyhow It ain't no use to see it and wonder why I be You don't know by now The rooster crows at the break of dawn To catch your window and I'll be gone You're the reason that I'm a trap so don't think twice, it's alright It ain't no use in turning on your light, babe That light I've never known It ain't no use in turning on your light, babe Side of the road. Still, I wish there was something you would do or say to try to make me change my mind and stay. We never did too much talking away, so don't think twice, it's alright. It ain't no use in calling out my name. and calling out my name, babe. I can't hear you anymore. I'm thinking and wondering, walking down the road. Once loved a girl, a child, I'm told. Gave her my heart, but she wanted my soul. So don't think twice, it's alright. So 
privilege to be here and, and to hearing all this wonderful music. I mean that song was so moving. We wanted to add all the the words to the to the video so that you could see, you know, Mike wrote that song himself. You know, and this is a sort of downside of us being here and you're all out there and we can't see you. But you know, we feel connected, don't we? And we do. we, we we, do. We're, we're just looking for the time where we can all get together again and sort of you know, it'd just be lovely to sort of, you know, hear the applause, but I, I hope all the artists are hearing the applause because we're all clapping and cheering you on at home. So thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for watching and making it, you know, making it special. 
So we've got Kimberly Palmer coming up next. Yes. And she's a local singer who's had over a decade of experience in live music and performs a wide range of styles from Motown to soul, soul and to dance. Oh, maybe we can get up and have a dance now. So I'm just sort of uh, get a bit of energy going, isn't it? You know, in the afternoon. So uh, I'm looking forward to this. Ooh, I'll switch off my video and have a little dance. Okay. <laughs> Palmer. This is my wonderful husband Joe, who's going to be my brilliant guitarist for today. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, we're hoping to do a few songs for you today. Hope you like them. Um, we're having wonderful weather at the moment, and fingers crossed, we've still got lovely weather on the weekend. Spend lots of time outdoors, not get too hot. <laughs> um, this first song is uh, I'll Be There by Jess Glynn. Uh, I feel like at the moment, especially, it's really important that everyone feels like they've got someone that will be there for them. So that's why I chose this song. I really like it anyway. <clears throat> okay. Our next song is, um, well, 
I grew up knowing it from the Fugees, but it's not theirs originally, but they did do a fantastic cover. Um, this is Killing Me Softly. Strumming my pain with his fingers Singing my life with his words Killing me softly with his song Killing me softly with his song Telling my whole life with his words Killing me softly I heard he sang a good song I heard he had a style And so I came to see him in listen for a while And there he was, this young boy A stranger to This next song is one of my all-time favourite songs to sing. Um, I always hear it in my head on a lovely sunny day and I see the birds flying around. And it was originally sung by Nina Simone. Um, that was fantastic. I also love the Michael Bublé version. I love the Muse version. And this is sort of my own little take on it. i 
Um, I'm checking the time, thinking how many songs we got left. We'll do Hey Ya. Mm -hmm. Ready? My guitarist is just having a refreshment. You'll find me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Kimberly Palmer Vocalist. Um, if you want to check me out, I'm on there. Um, thank you very much, Joe. It's been a wonderful accompaniment. And thank you very much, Kim. For a wonderful lead. <laughs> um, I hope everyone's well. I hope everyone's staying safe. And um, I think we might be able to sneak one more in. I'll give Joe a minute. <laughs>
We're back Hello. again. Oh, do you think they saw us dancing? No, no, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think. I think we managed to switch the video off. We know what we're doing now, don't we? Mm, vaguely, vaguely. <laughs> vaguely, vaguely, very vaguely. Oh, well, we've got our festival hats on anyway. Yes, yes, we're getting yes. in the mood for it now. Yeah, we're, we're definitely getting in the mood for it. We'll you be... hope you are out there. Yes, <laughs> this will we'll be professionals this time tomorrow. Oh well. Mm. You know, this is seems to be a bit sad actually because we've got our last artist now. But you know, it's certainly for the afternoon. Just for the afternoon, and um, yes, the lovely Matt Goodwin is going to be playing for us now on piano and guitar. And I've had the privilege of hearing Matt lots of times myself, so I'm looking yes. forward to this as well. And I know he's going to yes. be playing, he's going to be playing one of our songs, isn't he, Carol King? One of our songs, that is, isn't it? Yes. yes. All right, then. Well, enjoy. See you in a bit. See you in a bit. Hello there, my name is Matt and I'd very much like to sing some songs for you today. First up is a song from the great Stevie Wonder. This is called You Are the Sunshine of My Life. Sunshine of my life, yeah. That's why I'll always be around. You are the apple of my eye, girl. Forever you'll stay in my heart. I feel like this is the beginning. Though I loved you for a million years. If I thought this love was ending I found myself drowning in my own tears You are the sunshine of my life here yeah. And that's why I always stay around You are the apple of my eye You came to my rescue And though I know this must be heaven I can't so much to be inside of you oh, 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 oh. You are the sunshine of my life Yeah and That's why I love it stay around You are the apple my eye, girl, forever you'll stay in my heart, forever you'll stay in my heart. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to sing for you a song by the great Carol King. This is called You've Got a Friend. When you're down and troubled and you need some love and care and nothing feels like going right Close your eyes and think of me And soon I will be there To brighten up be 
sure you'll agree these have been really mad times lately and if there's a couple of things that it's taught me it's firstly to look out for your fellow people your fellow human beings <clears throat> and the other is is to question everything um question everything you're doing everything you're thinking and everything that can be done because uh, you never know what difference that can make uh this is a song of questions uh it's it's by bob dylan it's called blowing in the wind <laughs> Oh, 
friend is blowing in the wind The answer is blowing in the wind Before they are washed to the sea But how many years can some people exist Before they're allowed to be free And how many times can a man turn his head And pretend that he just doesn't see The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind How many times can a man look up before he will see the sky? How many years must one man have before he will hear our people cry? And how many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? The answer, my friend. So for my last song, I would like to sing for you one of my favourite songs. This is A Bridge Over Troubled Water. When you're weary Feeling small When tears are in your eyes I will dry them all I'll take your
Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of the Three Shires Festival. Cheers. You're still here. Oh, and I'm echoing already. Oh, is oh, oh, we're on. Here we are on. I hope we're on. Well, otherwise we're just talking to ourselves. And I'm fed up of talking to you. That's it. You're the only person I've seen for the last 14 weeks. Mm. Oh, I don't know. Never mind. I still, still love him. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's good. <laughs> you know, that... That aside... That, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the open mic sessions. Yes, I'm we very good they've been too. And we need to say thank you to everyone who's taken part this afternoon, don't we? We had. We have had uh, Martha Evans, Alice, John um, Goodwin, John Goodwin, John Barber, Licio, <laughs> uh, West Park Recorders Group, Mike Bainham, Kim Palmer, and ending with Matt Goodwin. And of course, we mustn't forget that wonderful talk by Andy Swinford. And again, you'll be able to listen to that again, because we think we're going to be posting everything up on our YouTube channel. It's so good. like and subscribe. And now, before I keep waffling on, we've got another treat. So I could change my hat now. Yes, yes, he's got to change his hat now, because I've gone out and picked some flowers. Is it poetry hat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we've got poetry corner now. Uh, if we're just sorting out the technicals. Yes, we've got, we're, we're, we're sort of expanding our mind here, aren't we? We've had music and we've had literature. And um, yes, and, and if I move out the way, you can have a little look at some look at the beach. The beach too. <laughs> right, let's get ourselves set up. Yeah, there's quite a few of people have contributed to our poetry corner and some original poems as well in there. And um, yeah, I'm not gonna be sort of doing the link so much. I just wanna let this run now. I'm, I've done a few poems and I just wanna say thank you for John Goodwin for organizing this and for everyone who has contributed. I know we've had Diane Eads poems and Helen McGowan has read some poems for yeah. us and John and myself. So a wide selection, which I hope you will appreciate and enjoy. No, still got to keep talking. <laughs> but we're nearly there. Brilliant. Okay, enjoy. in 1850. I shall only read a small portion of this because it is quite a long poem. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain and the deep and gloomy wood, their colours and their forms were then to me an appetite. A feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm, by thought supplied, nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That time is past, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint I nor mourn nor murmur, other gifts have followed, for such loss I would believe abundant recompense. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man. 
a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive. Well pleased to recognise in nature and the language of the sense the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. Forever Young by Bob Dylan May God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung. May you stay forever young. May you grow up to be righteous. May you grow up to be true. May you always know the truth and see the light surrounding you. May you always be courageous, stand upright and be strong. May you stay forever young. May your hands always be busy. May your feet always be swift. May you have a strong foundation when the winds of changes shift. May your heart always be joyful. May your song always be sung. May you stay forever young. A comic and sometimes moving a poem uh, performed by Richard Stilgo. Um, I'm not sure whether he wrote it or whether somebody else did, but uh, here goes anyway. My nose is wet and shiny. I never clean my teeth. Sometimes I lie upon my back and show my underneath. I do things on the pavement and I'm taken to the shops. But instead of being punished, I'm given chocolate drops. My name is... Mm, Sit, I think. Although it might be fetch or stay, but whatever people call me, I come running anyway. And I live with Mrs. Sanderson in a quiet south coastal widowhood. We often walk and talk together, and she throws me bits of wood. Sometimes she thinks that I can understand every single word. I can't, and that is why I never find her chattering absurd. I cannot reason, cannot laugh, I cannot count to ten. I count one, then more than one, and more than one again. Yet people in their more than ones to pets like me will turn for friendship and companionship, both words I cannot learn. For my conditioned reflexes seems designed to fill a gap that's left by humans when they're absent, cross or ill. My life's not complicated like the human she adores. I don't complain of migraine or go through the dog paws. I don't get bored with what went on at last week's WI. I don't forget to write and thank her for my shirt and tie. I cannot help but wag my tail and pant apparent thanks. I've no alternative. I'm as thick as more than one short planks. But my wagging and my panting and my dying for my queen is the nearest thing to true love Mrs. Sanderson has ever seen. A poem from Under Milk Wood by Dylan Thomas. Reverend Eli Jenkins Prayer Every morning when I wake Dear Lord, a little prayer I make O oh, please to keep thy lovely eye On all poor creatures born to die And every evening at sundown I ask a blessing on the town For whether we last the night or no I'm sure is always touch and go we are not wholly bad or good, who live our lives under milkwood. And thou, I know, wilt be the first to see our best side, not our worst. 
Oh, let us see another day. Bless us all this night, I pray. And to the sun we all will bow and say good night, but just for now. In 1939, T.S. Eliot published a book of light verse, Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. Now, Old Possum was Ezra Pound's nickname for him. But after Eliot's death, the book was adapted as the basis of the musical Cats by Andrew Lloyd Webber, first produced in London West End in 1981 and opened on Broadway the following year. McCavity. Cavity's a mystery cat. He's called the Hidden Paw. Well, he's the master criminal who can defy the law. He's the bafflement of Scotland Yard, the flying squad's despair. For when they reach the scene of crime, McCavity's not there. McCavity, McCavity, there's no one like McCavity. He's broken every human law. He breaks the law of gravity. His powers of levitation would make a fakir stare. And when you reach the scene of crime, McCavity's not there. You may seek him in the basement, you may look up in the air, but I tell you once and once again, McCavity is not there. McCavity's a ginger cat, he's very tall and thin. You would know him if you saw him, for his eyes are sunken in. His brow is deeply lined with thought, his head highly domed, his coat is dusty from neglect, his whiskers are uncombed. He sways his head from side to side with movements like a stake, and when you think he's half asleep, he's always wide awake. McCavity, McCavity, there's no one like McCavity. For he's a fiend in feline shape, a monster of depravity. You may meet him on a by street, you may see him in the square, but when a crime's discovered, then McCavity is not there. He's outwardly respectable, they say he cheats at cards, and his footprints are not found in any file on Scotland Yards. And when the larder's looted, or the jewel case is rifled, or when the milk is missing, or another peak's been stifled, or the greenhouse glass is broken, and the trellis past repair, aye, there's a wonder of the thing. McCavity's not there. And when the Foreign Office find a treaty's gone astray, or the Admiralty had lose some plans and drawings by the way, there may be a scrap of paper in the hall or on the stair, but it's useless to investigate. McCavity is not there. And when the loss has been disclosed, the Secret Service say, it must have been McCavity, but he's a mile away. You're sure to find him resting or a licking of his thumbs or engaged in doing complicated long division sums. McCavity, McCavity, there's no one like McCavity. There never was a cat of such deceitfulness and suavity. He always has an alibi, and one or two to spare. At whatever time the deed took place, McCavity wasn't there. And they say that all the cats whose wicked deeds are widely known, I might mention Mungo Jerry, I might mention Griddlebone, are nothing more than agents for the cat who all the time just controls their operations, the Napoleon of crime. And now a poem inspired by more recent events by Max Boyce, when just the tide went out. Last night as I lay sleeping, when dreams came fast to me, I dreamt I saw Jerusalem beside a tideless sea. And one dream I'll remember, as the stars began to fall, was Banksy's painting Alan Wynne on my neighbour's garage wall. And dreams like that sustain me till these darkest times have passed. 
and chase away the shadows no caring night should cast. But times like this can shine a light, as hardship often can, to see the best in people and the good there is in man. And I remember Swansea with nobody about, when the shops were closed like Sunday and just the tide went out. And I remember Mumbles with the harbour in its keep and the fishing boats at anchor that trawl the waters deep. And I heard the seabirds calling as the gulls all wheeled about. But all the town was sleeping now and just the tide went out. And when these days are over and memories remain of children painting rainbows when the sun shone through the rain. And I thought of all the nurses who stretched all the pain. And I hope they never get to see a time like this again. And I prayed last week for Boris, who knocked on heaven's door. And I thought of voting Tory, which I've never done before. And though the sun is shining now, I've no immediate plans. So I'll write a book on staying in and ways to wash your hands. And I'll remember mornings with nobody about, when the shops were closed like Sunday and just the tide went out. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Stay safe, everyone. The poem, I Remember, I Remember, by Thomas Hood, is one of the best literary pieces known for its themes of childhood and recollection of joys. It was first published in 1844 and the poet recalls his childhood memories and compares his childhood joy with his gloomy present. The poem deals with the wonder of life through childhood memories. I remember, I remember the house where I was born, the little window where the sun came creeping in at morn. He never came a wink too soon, nor brought too long a day. But now I often wish the night had borne my breath away. I remember, I remember the roses red and white, and violets and the lily cups, those flowers of delight. The lilacs where the robin built and where my brother set the laburnum on his birthday. The tree is living yet. I remember, I remember where I was used to swing and thought the air must rush as fresh to swallows on the wing. My spirit flew in feathers then that is so heavy now and summer pools could hardly cool the fever on my brow. I remember I remember the fir trees, dark and high. I used to think their slender tops were close against the sky. It was childish ignorance, but now it is little joy to know I'm farther off from heaven than when I was a boy. Without music all around us every single day, life would not be the same as we journey on our way. Birds sing their songs as they fly across the sky. Music is heard when we are born and there when we die. Music is at weddings and on a special day, it is there with us when we are far away. It's on trains and aeroplanes, in cars too. Music to suit everyone, including me and you. Some like soft and gentle, some like very loud, some like to hear it alone, some in a very big crowd. Music can be healing for many who are ill. It can be so relaxing to listen and be still. There are groups and pop stars with music that we know. There's music for the seasons, for wind, rain and snow. 
Music is in our schools and shops, in our homes too. Choirs and orchestras perform Mozart, Elgar, to name a few. Different types of music for young and the old. Some is very special in the memories that we hold. With no music, there can't be ballet, opera or a show. We would not be without it, that we truly know. Thank you for the talent of composers, great and small, for the wonderful gift of music, a great joy to us all. The po poem Home Thoughts from Abroad was originally written by Robert Browning. I like to think if he'd been alive today, he would have brought the poem up to date and this is what he might have written. Oh, to be in England, now July is here, and our hopes for Wimbledon are shelled until next year. The hopes of spring have gone away. The sky is overcast with grey. The rain, it raineth every day in England now. Oh, to be in England, now that summer's near, the coronavirus makes our lives a mite austere. We've loads of dosh we used to boast, but now we live on beans on toast, for affluence will be but a ghost in England now. Oh, to be in England where the traffic flows, where hippos stuck in treacle with a clamp around their toes. They say it is better fun to drive to, in hope than ever to arrive. Sounds very like the M25 in England now. Things aren't right in England, as anyone can see, yet England is, for all of us, the only place to be. The news may leave us all depressed, but Facebook gets it off your chest, and we still know that we're the best in England now. All right then. Well, the lovely Pam Ayres has always been a favourite of mine, and I'm going to try and do her poem justice now. And it's about a sad occasion that some of you may have already experienced in your lives. Um, but here it goes. It's called, Where There's a Will, There's Always a Sobbing Relative. All the family was gathered to hear poor Grandad's will. Fred was watching Alice and she was watching Bill. He was watching Arthur everywhere he went but especially at the cupboard where Grandad kept the rent. Outside on the patio, the sliding door was closed and sitting in a chair was nephew John, his face composed. He said, my dear old Grandad, I shall never see no more. And his sheets of calculations were spread across the floor. Downstairs in the kitchen, Sister Alice blew her nose saying, he always was my favourite. You knew that, I suppose. You couldn't have found a nicer man. I never loved one dearer. I'd have come round much more often if I'd lived that just bit nearer. Cousin Arthur sat alone. His eyes were wild and rash. And desperately he tried to think where old folks hide their cash. He thought about the armchair, the mattress and the bed. And he left his car at home and booked a Pickford's van instead. And then there were the bedroom floorboards. He studied every crack and twice while dusting the commode, he rolled the carpets back. But he knew the others watched him, you scavengers, he cursed. And every night he prayed, don't let the others find it first. The day that Grandad's will was read, it came up bright and clear. The lawyer man looked round and said, Now then, are we all here? Someone shouted yes, and someone else unscrewed his pen, and someone sat upon his coat, so he could not stand again. He carefully folded it and wonderingly said, This is the shortest will I ever will have read. He rolled a fag and carefully laid in a filter tip while beads of sweat they gathered on Cousin Arthur's lip. It says, my dear relations, thank you all for being so kind. 
and out beside the lily pond you will surely find the half a million pounds with which I've stuffed me garden gnome, which I leave with great affection to the Battersea Dog's home. Why, thank you. I hope you enjoyed that little poem by the lovely Pam Ayres. It is a nonsense poem by Edward Lear. It was first published in 1871 as part of his book Nonsense Songs, Stories, Botany and Alphabets and made famous in a song by Burl Ives. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five-pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh, lovely pussy, oh pussy, my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are. What a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married, too long we have tarried, but what shall we do for a ring? And they sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows. And there in a wood a piggy wig stood with a ring on the end of his nose. His nose, his nose, with a ring on the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? Said the piggy, I will. So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mince and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand, on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon. The moon, the moon. They danced by the light of the moon. I've got my pinny on! Oh my life! I just popped off to do some potatoes while I was in the break. I was still watching though. Oh no, leave that. What am I doing? What am I like? Oh, some lovely poetry there. Yes, wonderful. Thank you for, thank you John for organising that. And thank you for um, Helen, who read some lovely poems for us. And you may have spotted myself in there. And, um, and Di Diane Eads for uh... Yeah. For writing one of those poems as well. Yes, some lovely original contributions. So thank you for that. I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope that's been a good end to our afternoon, but mm -hmm. it's not over yet. We've got the best to come, I have to say. We've got some really fantastic headline artists lined up for you this evening. We have indeed. And yes, you've got time <coughs> to go off to the food court now. And um, although that might be in your own kitchen. <laughs> that might be in your own kitchen. And uh, yeah, go and grab yourself some food. You may want to get a pizza delivered and um, come back. It's seven o'clock. Yes, hopefully we'll get everything sorted and we'll be kicking off on time with Chris Roberts and Michelle Holloway. And that'll be followed by um, Amy Naylor on hand pan. So <coughs> ring everyone, tell everybody. It's going to be a great night. You can just... Enjoy it with a glass of wine and, you know, pretend you're back at the festival. So we'll see you all at seven o'clock. See you later. <laughs> bye bye.
remote. Hello! Hello! We're back again. Oh, welcome to the main stage, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen. Do you like our new outfits? Good, good right. try, haven't you? Indeed. We've managed to get to the bar. Well, I have anyway. Mm. I've got a cup of tea. He's got a cup of tea. Right. Tonight. What have we got lined up for tonight, David? Tonight we have three wonderful artists. Rising stars. Oh, absolutely. At least. At least, I more, tell you. More, They're more on their artists. way to the stratosphere, but <clears throat> you saw them here first. So what have we got? We have got Chris Roberts and Michelle Holloway. But before I say any more about them, I need to tell you a little bit about our festival. Three Shires Festival. That's been, this is our third year now. Our third year. And we were hoping for a sunny weekend at St Hilda's grounds. Instead, we're here. And it's raining. And it's raining. But, you know, we're inside and... Hopefully you've got a nice cosy chair and you're comfortable and uh, you're going to enjoy yourself. So we've had some support with this festival. Lots of people have been involved behind the scenes and we want to thank them all because they've just been amazing. Oh yes, there's a number of people that have pulled, pulled together, made videos for the, um, yeah, all the, video. for the open mic, for the, for the poetry. And, and all sorts of things behind the scenes helping it. It's been really... Yeah, we've all really learned how to do all the technical mm -hmm. stuff. You know, we were all a little bit... Um, well, it's not always having the energy to it. Yeah, we don't We're really trying. Mean. We're trying, we're trying. <laughs> anyway, I do need to mention that we've had some money from the National Lottery and they have been very generous towards us. And this has come from the National Lottery 25-year fund, which is helping to bring communities together celebrating 25 years of the National Lottery. So some of you may have, you know, benefited from the lottery in the past. Some, there may be some winners out there. There may be some millionaires out there. And if there are, maybe they'd like to give a little bit of funding to our festival. <laughs> <laughs> Just sort of drop that in there because there will be a link in the comments and yes, if you just do want to sort of like show you a bit of appreciation, all contributions would be welcome. They would indeed, and, and it's, uh, it's good to have something to, to start working on next year. Especially. Yes, because we want to be here next year on the grass, outside, enjoying the sun with lots of live artists. And so let's tell us, tell you who we've got coming up tonight. <clears throat> um, we've got Michelle Holloway and Chris Roberts. Now, do you like to tell them a little bit about this? We've got we've, we've got all the information here, ladies and gentlemen, oh, and we yes. want to let you know what's, you know, what you can expect. Yes, we've done all the research. Well, we rang up and had a chat to. We did, we did, we did. Um, Chris, Chris Roberts was uh, involved with the festival last year. Yes, some of you may have seen him. He was fantastic, wasn't he? Yeah, terrific, terrific. Brilliant. <clears throat> really, really top top-notch yeah. classical guitarist. Um, he, yeah, he, he has been praised much for, for his work. Um, and he's got a Welsh connection as well, oh, yes. you see. So yeah. that makes him a bit special towards me, you see. And some of his tunes tonight will be, uh, will be inspired by Welsh folk songs yes. and also featuring music from Wales, Ireland, West Africa and Finland. He, he's just brought out uh, an album, yes. Um, and that's on T Cares Records. So I'll I'm help. Glad, you. I'm glad you said that. Yes. I'll help you with the pronunciation. Adra. Adra. Where's Adra now? Adra. Oh, is that's correct? Solo album. Adra. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. I can speak well. Too well. <laughs> um, uh, and he's the currently, I'm reading here, gosh, we really are impressed. We are in uh, honoured company here tonight. Currently the artistic director of the Cardiff Guitar Festival. Mm, that's something else to check out, isn't it? Yes. Now, yes. let's talk about Michelle. She's also the founding member of the contemporary folk band Bonfire Radicals. Ooh, that have performed across England. In Venice, ranging from Village Halls to the Birmingham Symphony Hall. And the Royal Albert Hall, Cadogan Hall. My goodness me, we're so honoured that you we are. We are. graced us with your company here tonight. And yes, travelled all over the world. Um, played on Radio 3. Played on Radio 3. And 
she's currently working with a German composer, Soren Sieg. My German's not brilliant. Using loop pedals and building multi-layered minimalist compositions. Well, if that hasn't worked up your appetite, I do not know what. So, we could waffle on all night, couldn't we? We could. I know. But you'd much rather. Yes. Listen to the Christmas. professionals, wouldn't you? Chris and Michelle. So, Chris and Michelle, are you hiding in, in the background there? I hope you're waiting in the wings, ready and raring to go. Here they come. Hello, Chris. Nice to see you. <laughs> right, I'm going to say goodbye. Hi, Michelle. Right, we'll... Uh... Okay, well, I think that's us. That's our cue, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much everybody. That was a little tune called Boffons by um, Jakob Van Eyck, who was a performer, composer, Karelian player from, he was Dutch and he lived in Utrecht and he used to go and sit and play in the pleasure gardens back in the 1600s. And that was, yeah, Boffons was a little tune over a repeating bass line that you could hear Chris playing just then. And we're now going to move on to um, a tune called Pavan Lacrimae or Flow My Tears, which lots of you I'm sure will know. It's a beautiful lute song which was written by John Dowland, um, who was around at the same time as Van Eyck. And what we've done is we have the original lute song and we've mixed it um, with some variations with, which Van Eyck uh, made on well, yeah, made on this tune. So when, when Jakob Van Eyck was sitting in these pleasure gardens, he would improvise variations and melodies on popular tunes of the day, and so this was one of those. For those of you who don't know it, the, um, the first verse, the words are, flow my tears, fall from your springs, exiled forever. Let me mourn where night's black bird her sad infamy sings. There, let me live forlorn.
Chris is here, he's just looking at the comments. If you are there, please do um, write something in the comments to us so we're, we feel like we are playing to real people rather than just to the camera that we can see. What's happened? Oh, Chris. <laughs> I, was, I promised um, Dave and John that I would press the button saying turn on original sound before we started. Um, I did it during the concert, so that, that counts. <laughs> <laughs> also, the comments coming through about two or three minutes behind, so I'm watching us now still playing Flow My Tears. Um, but I'm enjoying, there's a lot of banter going on between Paul and Katie. Oh, that's good, lovely. Hi guys, <laughs> thanks for watching. <laughs> we're moving on to a, a different style now, but we're move, still staying kind of with a, a lament feel. I'm gonna let Chris tell you a little bit more about this piece. And this finished tuning. Yeah, sorry, all these pieces are a different tuning, which makes my life interesting. Um, so this is a piece here called Lament by um, Alan Thomas, who quite possibly, the, the beauty of these sort of things is quite possibly in the virtual audience. Um, so hi. hi Alan, <laughs> if you're watching. Um, this uh, is part of a, a songbook that he's um, kind of composed called uh, the Balkan Songbook, um, which is, I don't actually know how many pieces it is, he keeps adding to them um, all the time really, um, uh, based on uh, various tunes from around the Balkans. And uh, this one just, we've tried a few of them on the recorder and this one just seemed to, to really sit nicely. Um, yeah, that's about it really.
So this is uh, this is another piece of Alan's, um, again from the Vulcan Songbook. The Vulcan Songbook is um, almost exclusively pieces for um, well, written originally for flute and guitar, um, but there's one solo solo movement uh, called Heart No Longer Mine, um, which is based on a Bosnian uh, a Bosnian song, and um, what I particularly like about this piece, um, I've kind of been interested in it for a while, but never actually really um, learnt it. Um, Alan kind of combines uh, influences from electronic music um, and Balkan music as well. So you'll hear things like um, a kind of quasi kind of reverb in the in the leaving of the harmonics ringing, um, or things like um, a filter kind of effect. Using the kind of full kind of tonal capabilities of the guitar. Um, so this is Heart No Longer Mine by Alan Thomas.
Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I could have clapped for you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, in a weird way, as I was playing that, I was thinking... Had a comment. The kind of... No, no, the influence of, of kind of acoustic, um, traditional Balkan song and, like, electronic is very much like what we're doing here. Uh -huh. There we go. Um, what's next? The jigs. Oh, yes. So the, these... Um, we're now moving. Alan's, Alan's works, um, I think one of the reasons I like them so much is that they kind of um, inhabit this world between the classical and, and the folk. Um, and so they just were a really, really brilliant kind of um, uh, transition point um, from the more classical works of the first half um, to the, the more folky works of the second half. And this is a set of jigs um, by one of my favourite bands, uh, mm -hmm. Welsh bands called Calan. Um, and it, they're dedicated to um, a certain Welsh footballer um, <laughs> and they're called Ryan Jiggs. I'm going to assume we've just heard you all burst into rapturous um, laughter. <laughs> <laughs> rapturous laughter. <laughs> oh gosh, we'll find out in about three minutes. <laughs> You're still playing your solo on there. <laughs> Terrified. <laughs> oh wait, no, I'm not ready. Oh. I've also got a special other instrument down here, which you might hear. I hope you will hear. Oh, is it, is it a hook? Yeah. Is it the right one?
Um, oh yes, so these next two tunes um, <laughs> are... Old. Yeah, yeah, so these are two medieval tunes. The first is by a, a French medieval abbot called Gautier de Quincy. Um, and I came across this tune, um, I heard a lute player just demonstrating a bit, of, a bit of this tune and all I got was the name Gautier de Quincy. And I've been slightly obsessed ever since. Um, <laughs> I just think it's an amazing tune and everything he's written is, is, is just astonishing really. Um, and I, I know, I can't find very much about how it's written down or anything like that. So I just transcribed this tune and we've done a kind of vague version of it. Um, and I, yeah, I think it suits the recorder really, really well as well, fortunately. That's lucky, isn't it? <laughs> um, and the other is a, a Northumbrian um, small type tune. Um, Again, from a similar period, but obviously from Northumbria, um, and for a very different instrument. Uh, and they kind of, yeah, they work really well, they complement each other really well, and you can kind of hear how these two quite separate traditions, um, one, one sacred, one secular, one French, one, one English, um, kind of complement each other. Um, yeah, so this is Gautier de Quincy and the Northumbrian pipe tune. I wonder. Oh. No, don't, I don't think anyone laughed. <laughs> oh look, these two play faster than even the, the legends rhyme gig, gig, gigs. <laughs> 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 oh, that's a festival. <laughs> Thank you. 
It's really nice to play because it just grows and grows and just keeps on going. Is it the song star? Yeah. Yes, it is. Oh, it's you. Can I have my flute, please? Oh, yeah. I did wonder where it was. <laughs> um, so, anybody. Don't care. Um, anybody who's seen me play any um, any solo gigs in the last well, two years probably has almost certainly heard this piece um, because I used it to it would open every single gig that I did for yeah, a good two years um, and also is the opening track on the the album that um, <laughs> it's called uh, Lisa Lan and it's a traditional Welsh uh, song. Um, it's um, it's another lament essentially, um, a lover's lament for the for the late Lisa, um, who by the end he's asking essentially for the world to to take him into the earth where Lisa is. Um, so it's a sad song, but aren't all folk songs sad? Oh, I start. <laughs> So this next song is a song that um, we've both done separately with our own groups. Um, Chris with his duo Silk Seems Drift and me with a group of wonderful women here in Birmingham who actually I saw today for the very first time socially distanced in the park. So ladies, if you're watching, I love you very much and this is for you and for everyone who has been had to be distant from those that we love in these times. Not for you, Seth, but I think I forgot I told you it was happening. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Ada my friend story. <laughs> The summer time has come, and the trees are sweetly blooming, and the wild mountain thyme, all the colours of the human. Will you go, Lassie? Go, and we'll all go together. To pull out mountain time all around the blooming heather. Will ye go, Lassie, go? I will build my love. My true love will not come, then I'll surely find another to pull wild mountain time all around the blooming heather. Will ye go, lassie, go? Final tune for you, um, and this was actually the first tune that Michelle and I played <laughs> together. Um, again, but um, this was a, a kind of virtual video collaboration thing. Um, my duo has been doing um, a kind of weekly video for various people, and you were the first collaboration I could think of, weren't you? Yeah. How do you feel about that? Still, the most used. I probably shouldn't say that. On, on... <laughs> Come on. It means that Chris has always played it with me playing the tune but this is the first time I played it with him live yeah, yeah. rather than a click and it's another Northumbrian pipe tune and it's called The Lads of Anik shall I start do you want to show that 
Yeah, so I'm using this little drone box. Show us about it. I'm sure some of you have seen it. It's got a foot pedal as well, so it's really difficult to lift. But that's where the drone is coming to make Michelle's recorder sound like... I thought you were going to say sound better. It, well... <laughs> here we go. Um, yes. Thank you um, very much for having us at the Three Shires Festival. We think you're great. And um, we've been um, dropping in during the day, so it's been really nice to see everything that's going on. Please stick around for everything that's um, coming up afterwards as well. To, to David and Catherine, who've been here all day. I'm so impressed every time we turned on. Absolute <laughs> troopers. Um, and yeah, stay tuned for Amy Naylor, hand pan. Hand pan or hand pan? We'll find out, I'm sure, amongst all of the things. I'm going to go before I embarrass myself anymore. Bye! <laughs> oh, my life! We're back. Oh, right, get rid of the echoes. Right, we're on. Oh, that was so wonderful, wasn't it? Oh, that, 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 was, that was lovely. Oh, God, can you see me properly? Sorry, I've put my big hat on. Here I am on the main stage with me, me, me lovely assistant here. So, yeah, I feel, I, feel quite, I feel quite swept away with all of that. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Michelle. You've been amazing. Absolutely amazing. Such a high standard of playing. Oh, yeah. Yes. I'm sure you're going to just fly. Your careers are just going to fly musically. So I'll be, I'll be watching you. Just remember me when you're rich and famous. All right. And, and if you want to hear more of Chris, don't forget uh, his uh, debut his... album, album, Adra. Yes, T Care of uh, Records. Um, you can Google all these people, and they're on YouTube and Facebook and all these modern places where young, where these youngsters, these hang, youngsters out. hang out. Just yes, yes, where these youngsters where, hang out. Where have I gone? Yes. Over. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so what have we got now? Right, we better behave mm. because oh, I am so happy to introduce the next artist, who is actually a personal friend of mine, Amy Naylor. Now, Amy plays the handpan, and oh, this is a 
beautiful instrument and I'm very privileged to have one myself and I'm learning to play uh, but you know in light years ahead of time I might get somewhere near the beautiful Amy Naylor who is a songwriter, percussionist, taiko artist, she plays those big drums you know and a music, music practitioner yeah. and um yeah, Amy's, Amy's really special. She crafts her performances and workshops to create a space where connection can blossom. And she has a div div very diverse repertoire of modern mantras, poignant yet playful songs, uplifting melodies that are constantly evolving. And, you know, for someone so young, she's traveled the world. She's already been to playing in Europe, Canada, North America. I know she's recently just come back from North America, just managed to get back in, well, you know, with all this lockdown, all this traveling is a bit difficult, isn't it? But she's also got some lovely albums out. I can recommend Slacktivist. Great album. I know this one. Um, oh, could have been made bigger. Look, I'm up in the corner again. Right. No, you're, you're Am big. I big? You're big. Okay, no worries. Anyway, right. So I'm going to shut up because you want to listen to Amy. That's what you're here for. So, um, Hope she's there, ready, waiting in the wings. We're going to switch her on and away we go. Hello, Amy. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you so much for that warm welcome. It's so good to be here. Um, thank you, uh, Chris and Michelle, for such an amazing set. That was really fun. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, this is a song of mine called A Child I Always Am. And I know that we're all so far away from each other, but it would be really cool if we could try and get that feeling of connecting with, with each other just by humming along, singing along as you listen, that would be really cool. And uh, hopefully we can all feel each other as we do that. So, this is A Child I Always Am. A child I always am, through fog and through snow. A child I always am, it's better you know. A child I always am, through wind and through rain, a child I always am, I'll never know pain. A child I always am, through fog and through snow, a child I always am, it's better you know. A child I always am, through wind and through rain, a child I always am, I'll never know pain. Yeah. 
always know A child I always know It's better you know A child I always know Through wind and through rain A child I always am I'll never know pain Thank you uh, yeah, so this is, if you've never seen one of these instruments before, this is called a handpan. It's made out of steel, it's got a big hole in the bottom, um, and it's inspired by uh, steel pans that you find in the Caribbean, and also uh, kind of domed gongs that you'll see across uh, Southeast Asia. And these were invented in the year 2000, so they're super, super new, and I've had one for about five years now, so I've been playing for about five years. This next song that I'm going to play for you um, it's called Nakama no Koi, and it's a Japanese, Japanese lyrics, um, and it was written as part of a project a couple of years ago that I was involved in, where lots of female uh, taiko players, taiko is Japanese drums, got together to create a piece of music that involved drumming, dance, and a song. And so um, I've taken the song and I've used it in lots of different contexts, and this is just one version, one version of this song today that I'm going to play for you. And it roughly translates to something along the lines of uh, my comrades, um, our voices echo across the mountains, let's dance. So. YouTube open here on my friend so I can see ah, I can see all your lovely comments and I can see my friends here cool awesome that's really cool hi everyone so this is uh, a brand new handpan which I'm really excited about and I'm gonna play you a brand new song uh, which I've never played before and hopefully it doesn't go too wrong but we'll see it doesn't have a name yet so if you uh, if you're feeling inspired please do type type a name in the comments if you can think of anything
just realised when I got to the end of that piece that I haven't written an ending yet. <laughs> I didn't know how to end it. Um, okay, I've already kind of... I wrote a set list, but if anybody anybody here who knows me knows that I, I'm not very good at sticking to set lists, so I kind of already ruined that one. Um, let's, let's sing a song. I'm going to look for a song. Baby, baby. Hi, Shay. Hi, my man. Hi, Chris. Hi, Helen. Oh, cool. So many cool people. Okay. This is a cover. This is a song by uh, Laura Marley. It's called Alas, I Cannot Swim. Sing a, uh, play a piece now, um, which if you saw the uh, advert for, for this weekend, then you might have seen a snippet of it. Um, I call this piece uh, Dancing in a Concrete Jungle. Uh, I don't know where that came from. I think, so the view actually that I have right now is is outside of my window, my room window. And right now there's lots of storm clouds and a big rainbow, <laughs> which it feels like I'm really at a festival. But it's broken up by all these high-rise buildings. So as I wrote this piece, I was sitting over there in the room looking out the window. So yeah, I like that contrast, the beauty of the rainbow and the brick, brick walls. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you. 
interesting little stumble halfway through there. <laughs> it's been a long, really long time since I've like, performed a gig. It's since I think the last time was probably March. So this is I feel super out of practice. Um, this is really nice. So thank you so much for having me again. Um, yeah, this has been cool. Um, I'm gonna switch now to the guitar. I think for a little bit. Um, I'm really aware of time. I don't want to go over too much. So I'm gonna play a song for you now. Um, another kind of another one of my mantra type songs. It's called the Earth Teaches. And um, yeah, I performed this. This is an uh, this and a few other other songs that I'm playing tonight. Um, I performed this as part of a concert in March, which was my last gig. Um, it's called Project Ikigai, and uh, my partner in crime, I think he's in the comments right now, if he wants to wave. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we did a huge two-hour concert online, which you can still find. And this was one of the songs in it. This is called The Earth Teaches. Should the earth tremble, I'll grow taller with it all. 
like the clouds I'll flow through the sky And with each passing moment I'll let it go by Like the water I always offer life And I like to see a reflection Of the beauty in your eyes Of the beauty in your eyes <laughs> Same thank you, like, I can see you. <laughs> okay, um, I'm, I'm kind of aware of time, I don't want to go over too much, um, but if it's okay, I'll do a couple more songs. Um, yeah, just let me know. Um, private message me if it's too late. Um, I'm going to do another cover. It's not too late, it? <laughs> My man wave. Cool. So, decisions, decisions. This is a song I'm gonna do. Uh, this is, okay, so, that was a song for my man. Um, and if Kelsey's still watching, this is, this is a Jose Gonzalez song. This is my favorite song by him. Thank you. 
This is great. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Um, okay. In that case, I'm going to play a couple more. This is... Oh, what should I do first? I'm going to do one, actually... I'm going to do one that... Um, has it holds a lot of meaning for me. This is a cover song, um, and I used to sing it a lot on my own. Um, and I've since been performing this with Project UPI, and I I played this song um, at the women's gathering, a women's handpan gathering, two years ago, where I met Catherine, which is how we came to be here uh, today. And we were all just kind of sharing songs around the fire, and um, everything that everybody offered was really really beautiful, and it's such a like. It's such an amazing memory for me, and that night I think changed everybody in that tent's world completely. Um, and so this was my offering that night, and uh, every time I play it, I'm reminded of that. And every time I play it, I'm reminded of other times that I played it. There was a really beautiful moment uh, when I performed this with Maman at, at, uh, at a gig in Toronto, where we just got rid of the microphones and just sat together and played. And <coughs> so anyway, yeah, this is this is Sea of Love. It's by Phil Phillips, you might have heard it before. This is my handpan version.
Thank you. Um, I'm gonna do one more song, and um, yeah, I, I, I'm. I like to end with this. Well, I I would be ending with this at my gigs if if I had been gigging. Um, I actually wrote this in January, so I haven't really had the chance to, to do that with this yet. But this is a, a gratitude song. This is I wrote this while I was staying at a friend's house in Italy, and she looked after me for a whole month, which was really really great. Um, thank you, Julia. I really appreciate that. And. Yeah, I was feeling a lot of gratitude for where I, was, where I was in the world and the people that were looking out for me and the people that were hosting me and giving me so many amazing opportunities and welcoming me into their lives while I was traveling. And so, yeah, I want to end with this because I, I just think it's really important to always acknowledge how amazing it is that we're in this space, how like all the people that got us to this place, like the person who ever owned this guitar before me and decided to donate it, whoever made it, whoever helped the guy who was making the guitars to get so good at making guitars, thank you. Um, the person who made my handband, like there's so many people involved in like in the process of me getting to this point right now, in, in the process of you guys getting to your point right now. So I think it's always really important to acknowledge that. So that's what this song is. It's called I Thank You. Um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. None of the music I've played is on any of my CDs, <laughs> but I'm working on some new, new CDs, so they'll be available soon. And if you want to hear more music, you can go to my website, amynamemusic.com. So yeah, thank you. This is I Thank You.
echoes through my <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Amy! <laughs> I've jumped into the corner. Can you see me? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Oh, wow. Oh, man. I'm going to just do my applause on behalf of all of us. So that was fantastic. Thank you, lovely Amy. Um, right, we're back on again. <laughs> we are. That, 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 that was oh, lovely, wasn't it? Wow, that was amazing. <sighs> wow, I'm feeling really chilled out now. Honestly, thank you so much, Amy. I've got a little bit of an echo in the background here, following me about. I'm going to turn it down. So. Ladies and gentlemen, that is, well, not quite the end, but, you know, all our lovely artists have come and shared their wonderful talents with us. And we're so grateful to Chris and to Michelle and to Amy. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> oh, right. Am I still here? You're still here, yes. Ah, yes, there I am. Sorry. We just want to, yes, this is time to say thank you. Thank you to all our headline artists, Paul Hodgetts this morning, Chris and Michelle, Amy, Andy Swinford. I did a little bit myself. And then everybody was involved with our open mic. We had Martha and Matt and John and, oh, my life, you'll have to read it yourself. I can't read that quickly. <laughs> But all the poetry corner, technicals, publicity, creative committee, John Barber, Marion, John, Susie, Sue, and everyone else who knows me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to everybody. No, this has been, you know, the first time we've ever done something like this online. And we've had a few hitches along the way, but I hope you thank you to everyone who's stuck with us. Yes. You know, thank you. Thank you to our lovely audience. And we hope you've enjoyed it. And we really hope you enjoyed it. Now, if any of you just feeling like, oh, right, I just want to have a complete chill out now, we're going to be playing a meditation. Um, this is something that I have led. And the music has been uh, done by John Barber as well. That will be in the background. So that will be coming up next for anybody who just literally wants to sit back. Something a bit different, but... You know, sometimes I think we may need something like this, you know, in these difficult times. Like I say, all the artists are, um, you can find them on YouTube and Facebook and Google them and find out what they're doing and where they're going to be next and look out for them when, when we're all allowed out. So do we need to say anything else? There is a, for anybody who is interested, St Hilda's Church will be doing a live service on um, on Zoom, on still on this this uh, channel, and that's celebrating the 80th anniversary of the church. And we've got Bishop Anne coming to preach, and lots of more lovely music and other things going on there as well. So if anybody's interested good. in that, that'll be good. Um, yeah, we'll see you all then. And so, like I say. We're just going to end the evening now with a meditation. It's about 20 minutes and like this, you know, well, find out whether it's for you or not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's been fantastic. Right. Good night. Oh, just press OK. okay. Still here, just, just get it sorted. Hmm. There with us, we were doing so well. <laughs> Okay, one minute.
We'll come back on and just say sorry about this ladies and gentlemen um we're just going to take a short break i think that's probably the best thing we can do and just give us five minutes and then if you come back and we'll have the meditation ready for you then okay see you soon see you soon
comfortable and that's okay now I invite you to just notice the sounds what can you hear Maybe starting with sounds close by. And then 
and listening for sounds further away in the distance. Try not to make any judgment about these sounds, whether you like them or not, just allowing them to be there, coming and going. Some no sounds may be loud. Some may be pleasant to the ear. Other sounds you may not like, but just try not to get caught up in this. Let the sounds be as they are. You don't need to go out hunting for the sounds. Just let them come and go. Take a deep breath in and bring your focus to the breath. Bringing your attention to each breath as it comes in. and each breath as it goes out. There is nothing else to do. You may find your mind is caught up with thoughts, busyness, trying to take your attention away with plans and ideas, thoughts of what you could be doing. The mind is always busy and finds it very difficult to settle and that's okay just like the sounds thoughts will come and go but in this practice we are trying to not banish these thoughts recognizing that they are part of our experience but we don't always need to give them our full attention. Right now, I invite you to bring your attention to your breath, breathing in and out. Letting go of all those thoughts. And then simply noticing the 
the rhythm of your breath. You may find it helpful to count the breaths. Quietly in the silence, counting each out breath until you reach ten. One, If you find yourself getting caught up in thoughts and losing where you are, just come back to the beginning. So often we can get caught up with our thoughts, wanting things to be different. Wanting to be somewhere else. Finding it difficult to just be where we are, doing what we're doing. We have this fear of missing out. Feeling that we should have more be more. Or do more. I invite you to recognize the needs you have to simply rest. To let go. To experience pleasure. Giving yourself permission to stop and relax.
take a deep breath in now and slowly let the air release. And now I'm going to invite you to offer yourself some kindness and some compassion. For whatever it is you may be finding difficult in your experience, Can you hold that with some tenderness, with some understanding, as if you were reaching out to a good friend? Offering love, offering peace. You may wish to put your hand over your heart area and I offer you these words that you may like to speak to yourself in the silence. May I be well. May I be free from suffering. May I forgive myself. May I be kind to myself. be loving towards myself. May I listen to myself. May I let go of harmful thoughts criticism and judgment. May I offer myself kindness, compassion and understanding. You can return to these words of kindness any time you feel you may need them. When your mind is feeling scattered or troubled. You can take a moment to refocus your attention in a way that is kind, gentle and generous.
we are going to be bringing this practice to a close in a few minutes time so just take these last moments to bring your attention back to the breath, back to the body, and then slowly, once more, taking in your surroundings your contact with the chair or the cushion. Your feet on the ground and the sounds nearby and in the distance. And then slowly when you are ready, open your eyes.